And Chair Powell, would you like to make a couple of comments? Thanks, thanks, Chair Beeson. Just um, on behalf of the board to thank um, the board staff and especially uh, Maggie Flatten, who organized the tour of the University of Minnesota Genomics Center. I want to, you know, thank them on our behalf uh, for that tour. I mean, that is, um, as you heard from uh, Vice President uh, Kramer, that is a core capability of the research enterprise here. And I think for us to be able to see that and understand the role it plays, uh, it's uh, it's really, really. Uh, uh, a positive, uh, uh, you know, and, and important thing for the board to experience. So I don't know, I don't know where Maggie is, but the team, but uh, you guys, thank you very much, very much appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Regent Paul. I think we'd all echo those comments, uh, pass along our, uh, our, uh, our, our thanks. Regent McMillan, are you, have you rejoined us now? Okay, we'll uh, maybe uh, connect with you uh, some point this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to have the student representatives for assigned to this committee introduce uh, themselves and since you're all experiential learners, maybe you talk a little bit about uh, briefly about what you did this summer and uh, what those learning experiences were like in your your majors. So I'll ask uh, Mr. Kraft to start if you if you would. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Austin Kraft. I am a fourth year undergraduate student here on the Twin Cities campus in a dual degree program in mathematics and linguistics, minor in computer science. This summer, I um, served as an information security specialist for a, um, an international NGO doing peace building work and um, went out, uh, got to see both coasts this summer, uh, one for a mathematics program and one for vacation. Sounds good. Awesome. Um, hi there, board. My name is Alora DeMuth. I'm originally from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, so definitely a northern Minnesota girl. Um, I currently represent the Crookston campus. I'm double majoring in agricultural education and communication, so experiential learning is definitely the name of the game in my woods. Um, had a pretty eventful summer doing a couple different things, uh, working not only with Minnesota FFA, had the pleasure of meeting um, Vice President Pence earlier this spring, which was a pretty cool um, opportunity, as well as working with our Crookston admissions department with um, event planning, marketing, and communications. Great. Well, welcome to the Board of Regents, and we look forward to your contribution, and uh, it will be uh, a great experience for you, I'm sure. Well, uh, I'm going to be quarterbacking for Regent McMillan uh, for, uh, for this meeting, and I did have the chance to visit with him last Thursday to look at this month's playbook. and get its direction for game day, if you will, uh, on items we'll be talking about shortly. I promise not to overdo the pigskin, pigskin parlance, uh, but it is football season, and President Gable is 2-0 and all up to this point. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the record. So today we have four significant review items that will bring back to this committee and to the board in October for final consideration. Along with an informational presentation on family student housing, recall that got bumped uh, back last winter uh, due to time constraints. So we're looking forward to having that come back. And then in addition, uh, we've got several informational uh, items. I'm going to try to keep us on schedule uh, uh, in as much as these, these items are all uh, informational. Uh, there'll be time between now and the next meeting to further discuss with staff. Uh, uh, any open questions that you might have. So uh, it'll be halftime after the dining room conversation. We'll break for a few minutes then. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get to uh, work. Regent McMillan, you have rejoined us now. Is that correct? I am on the phone and attentively listening. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we... Uh, uh, I, unless there's any questions on our agenda, I'd like to proceed to a review of our committee work plan for 2019 and 2020. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, the plans, of course, have been developed with your input, uh, as well as that of the administration, and it's been led by our board leadership and our, uh, our chair of our board. So the items that this committee focuses on center around our fiduciary duties, uh, of reviewing and recommending budgets, both operating and capital, uh, reviewing various financial health and expenditure reports, uh, 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 the health of our finances and expenditures that are related to that and exceptions, items that demonstrate our long-term 
financial health as well as uh, our current financial situation. And finally, uh, informing and being informed by the board's strategic planning process throughout the year. That's what this plan attempts to do, all those things. And then it leaves room uh, for uh, opportunities that arise or for a change in priorities as, as the circumstances uh, warrant them. So with that, uh, I'm asked Senior Vice President Burnett if you want to add anything to the plan of which you were uh, so instrumental in helping, uh, helping craft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have much to ask. It's a very robust work plan. And again, we've left in a lot of ga uh, gaps in the work because we just know things come up throughout the year with respect to various items with respect in finance and operations. So uh, I think it's a very good plan. We appreciate the input from so many on it, and we look forward to delivering on these priorities over the next year. On that, I'll open up to the committee for additional questions or comments for our work plan for the year. All right, then we will uh, we'll get to work. First item is the 2019 six-year capital plan and the 2020 capital plan. These are separate, but they're related. Uh, and Senior Vice President Burnett's going to join Vice President Bertelson at the table. And Ms. Ewell is here and some technical assistance. Uh, so as they assemble, uh, I'll just say, um, uh, we want staff to be aggressive at identifying projects for a six-year budget, so you see into the category of under consideration. We'd like that to be expansive. We want, we want, there are always going to be surprise projects, opportunities that arise, but we really like when projects make their way through a six-year budget. And so uh, this list has a number of items, and some of which you might not have heard of before, but that's that uh, this process forces that sort of discipline around the university. Um, well, on that note, I will turn this over and let's walk through, uh, let's walk through the proposals for our six year plan and this upcoming year's plan. Senior Vice President. Thank you, Chair Beeson, members of the board and committee. Good, good, good afternoon. Today we present the 2019 six-year capital plan and the 2020 state capital request for review. Um, this six-year plan is required by board policy. It is the official document that sets the direction for our major capital projects. Because we have limited resources and limited capacity for projects that we must ensure our highest priorities show in this plan. And as you know, university priorities do change as does the makeup of the state legislature and the economy that supports bonding for many of our buildings. This plan provides for variability in the out years. This 2019 plan in particular includes several placeholders in anticipation as we welcomed a new president and a new provost eventually, intentionally leaving them opportunities to make strategic decisions about the future of capital investments for this university. The plan also includes several projects that are under consideration. Work continues on these. Some may come to fruition, some may not, but it is our goal to provide this board with a clear picture of the broader picture of pipeline of projects that may come before you in the coming years. And finally, this is the tool we use to build future state requests and capital budgets. In fact, one of the major purposes of this six-year capital plan is detailing future state capital requests. So there are two primary pieces that inform the plan. First and foremost are our mission priorities. These are gathered from our chancellors, our deans, and prioritized by the provost, the vice president for research, and the vice president for health sciences. We also collect and analyze our faculty, our facility priorities, and as you know, we have many facility priorities. The mission and facility needs are balanced against available resources to arrive at the plan that's before you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Vice President Bertelson for this part of the presentation, Mr. Chairman. Vice President Bertelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, you can see in front of you the, uh, the six-year plan priorities. This set of priorities has been quite consistent um, for the last several years um, as, um, because it takes a long time to bring these kind of projects to fruition, a lot of planning, and then as they work their way through. And so I'll talk more about each of them as we go through the presentation. Let's start with our number one priority to address our poor and critical um, facilities and the deferred 
capital renewal that we face. We aspire to be a top university, and we, in many ways we are, but we cannot continue to achieve or sustain that without major investments in our facilities. To keep pace with the needs, the university should be investing, frankly, more than double what it is today in its existing, in renewing its existing physical assets. When we look at the various campuses, you can get a sense of the, the, the shape of which of our buildings is an excellent or excellent or good shape, how much are a fair or how much in poor and critical shape. We have a massive facility portfolio, um, over $12 billion replacement value, and of those buildings, over 50% are over 50 years old. So in total, almost 8.5 million of our 30 million square feet is now considered poor or critical shape, a number which continues to inch up over time. So how do we get to this place? Um, largely by depending on sources of funds that are somewhat unpredictable. This gives a sense, this chart gives us a sense of where our money for renewal has come from. And so by year, you can see in gold, our repair and replacement money. This is funds the university self funds out of its operating budget. The maroon, which is HEPR, which we get from the state. The gray, which is asset reinvestment, which can come from the university or the state when we fix a building up, say Pillsbury or uh, Tate, the money for that renewal that fixes up that building counts in the gray. So they're very sporadic when a big project comes along or when it doesn't. Collectively, um, we've been averaging about, across these number of years, almost about $40 million a year in HEPR and r, &R. But you can tell based on the sporadic nature of the state bonding, uh, it's hard to plan for and at least a very uncertain, uneven um, level of investment in a very recurring and predictable growth and aging of our facilities. So in fact, over the last 10 years, um, our deferred renewal target has grown almost $600 million. So how do we deal with that? We do a variety of things. We work hard to manage the amount of space we have and look for space utilization. We also have done created what we call a building by building investment strategy. We've identified both objective and subjective measures to identify the future for every building on campus and identify which ones are worthy of further investments and which ones we should be planning for some kind of phased out process. So we tar that way we can help target our scarce resources to the ones that we think are worthy of maintaining and being keeping. When we think about HEPR projects, we are hopeful that the state will continue its partnership with us and provide significant HEPR in 2020. Oops, I missed this slide, thank you. Um, HEPR really is our main defense against poor and critical uh, condition buildings. We have a large list of projects that, would, that we would tackle with our $200 million request. In the end, the project will still have to be, will of course be scaled to match whatever funding is available. Of the projects, we have targeted them almost over 90% of them toward those catch up and keep up buildings based on those highest priority or building by building plan. And over 70% of the investment aligns closely with our six year plan themes that we talked about. Many of the larger, higher impact projects like Duluth Chemistry Building or the Mechanical Engineering Phase 3 in the Twin Cities would not be possible without a large heaper bill. Second plan priority is advancing health sciences. Um, University of Minnesota, as you know, is one of the most comprehensive health sciences centers in the country, trains over 70% of the healthcare professionals in the state, and both the state and you for the university have made major investments in our health sciences. Um, over time, one at the Bio Discovery District, which you just toured, and most recently the, the Health Science Education Center, which is currently in construction, and we look forward to taking you on a tour of that in the future as well. That will be opening its doors in the spring of 2020, and is the first project outcome of Governor Dayton's Blue Ribbon Commission. Um, it will bring students uh, to learn together from across a variety of our health professional um, areas into cutting edge facilities where they can better um, learn their craft. We, last year, we introduced the concept of a mul major multi-building renovation and new construction program to continue to advance health sciences investments. Pre-designed to define the scope of a new clinical research building is underway, and the intent of that building is to bring together a range of clinical research centers in alignment with our clinical care and the clinical surgery center. In addition to that, we have a large array of follow-up domino buildings and rent reinvestments, um, reinvesting in things like PWB and Moose, which are buildings we know we will be keeping and using for decades to come. Um, and finally, at the end of that payoff of that large, long plan, 
um, would be the replacement and de demolition of a variety of buildings to try to um, eliminate the buildings which aren't worthy of maintaining. Much work is still to be done to determine the components of this critical path and to complete these steps. And we know this plan and program will require a partnership both of the University of Minnesota, the Foundation, M Health, Fairview, uh, and the large, complex program that that is. And we will have more of that to talk to you about over the years. Um, laboratories in St. Paul. Um, we. And our all fund strategy, HEPER, is going to be a, play a major role in renovating existing buildings on, this, on St. Paul and has been both in Andrew Boss already and is now in the Food Science and Nutrition Building and in the future will be for things like Alderman Hall. A comprehensive re approach to renewal and facilitate the programs and will lead to a renovation of floor by floor for many of these buildings because um, we know the course structure of those is stable. Um, but we'll need continued reinvestment. Future capital plannings will also consider the utilization of existing space before we try to pursue new. And where we do have new construction that shows up for St. Paul from our plan, it will be uh, followed up by demolition of like amount of space. So we believe that St. Paul, the campus, has enough total space but the wrong quality, and we need to, to, to address that. Expanding capacity in STEM is a major priority for the system. Chemistry is a core component of most STEM programs and the U does not have an adequate supply to meet our demand. The Heikola CAMS building provided desperately needed chemistry, chemistry teaching facilities at the UMD campus and has been recently opened. The 2020 capital request seeks funding for similar undergraduate chemistry and teaching capacity in the Twin Cities campus. The new chem teaching facility would replace and improve Outdated facility is currently spread across, inefficiently spread across research labs throughout Coltoff and Smith. Would um, increase semester enrollment to 3,300 undergraduate students and accommodate a 14% increase in chemistry enrollment while reducing the chemistry lab sizes by nearly 15% and put them in modern chemistry teaching labs for the first time in decades. In addition to that, HEPER cuts through many themes and the 2020 includes major investments in mechanical engineering, trying to finish the, phase th the third phase of a three-phase renovation of mechanical engineering, as well as other investments in science and engineering, and a renovation of the existing uh, historic UMD chemistry. Finally, for the priorities, the repositioning of libraries for the 20th, 21st century. <clears throat> libraries remain in high demand and are a priority for our campuses, um, providing research, support services, learning labs, technology enhanced spaces, and a good example that will be open in Health Science Education Center, which opens in the spring, will providing faculty commons, uh, computer, visualiza computer visualization labs with technology-rich information, one-button studios where students and faculty can record their own presentations, and consult consultation rooms where library staff can meet with staff, um, faculty, and students on special projects. This is all done while also managing, downsizing, and relocating our existing collections because the purpose and sort of use of the library space is changing. So how do we uh, move lesser used materials offsite? How do we create a stronger retrieval process, continuing access to those resources, and continuing to grow our electronic materials? We've had an 85% of the University of Minnesota collection budget is really about electronics now. So with that, we'll turn to the 2020 state capital request. And Mr. Chairman, this is a summary Vice of what President Vice President, President Bertelson um, uh, presented here. Uh, on the chart, you can see our top priority as suggested by the administration is $200 million request from the state for the HEPA projects across our system. Um, and similar to last year's bonding request to the state, um, the second priority would be the child development replacement facility on the Twin Cities campus, which would be a two-thirds, one-third project, the state um, matching that as our, as our suggested financing. Third would be the A.B. Anderson Hall capital renewal on the Duluth campus, which has been on the list for quite some time, and another two-third, one-third, and then the introduction this year of this of what Vice President, <coughs> President Bertelson just discussed, chemistry undergrad teach, undergraduate teaching laboratories on this Twin Cities campus is a very sizable investment nearing $100 million. 
the health sciences strategic capital investment design to get this moving uh, we, as would be our fifth priority for your consideration. We believe that it's time to get the clinical research facility designed and, and moving in its place following the health sciences education center opening. And then we have quite a bit of work to do as an administration to figure out the next phases of the health sciences improvement program across our big portfolio of very aging buildings and aged buildings within the health sciences. How does this play out with respect to our um, financing profile? In the, in, the, in the gold would be what we would hope that the state would contribute, and in 2020 you would see the, the total request to the state would be 317. We've had preliminary discussions with um, the governor's budget office about a number in that range, and they were receptive to a number in that range. I can uh, share that with the regions. Um, the second one is really in two parts, what our normal capital request would be, and then if we were to proceed in 2021 with this large health science strategic investment, you can see that that is a very large ask if, um, if we're able to put, the, put that together and, and, put, and figure that out. We still have a lot of work to put the details behind that upper bar and the gold there. And then this is how it would play out over the future between the universities one-third, two-third. How that affects our project, uh, projected debt capacity is shown in this slide, where the projected total debt um, today is about 1.4 billion. Um, our capacity today is about 1.6. Uh, this university historically has been very aggressive in paying down its principal. Generally around 80 to 100 million a year of principal is paid off. And you can see that in the maroon chart and the maroon bar is moving down that absent any additional debt issued, um, we're moving down and giving ourselves room to make the needed investments we uh, have to in our capital program to ensure this university's competitiveness and its success. And with that, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to turn it over for some closing comments to President Gable on this uh, recommendation. President Gable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to chime in because, of course, this is the President's capital plan, but um, as many of you can see, or for those of you who haven't seen it before, I will uh, point out that this plan looks very similar to the way it has in the past. Uh, and that is for good reason. Um, that plan came to be before you in its current condition and evolved from a really robust conversation between um, campus administrative leadership and this board and um, includes a collective wisdom with which I agree. It reflects um, our institution's commitment to top-notch learning environments, to discovery, to fiscal stewardship, and to competitiveness. It reflects the beauty of the campus and the importance that we feel towards the historical um, preservation of the things that make us visually unique while also looking forward and making sure we have the infrastructure to reflect what we're going to need in the future to serve our students, to serve our scholars, and to serve the state as a whole. And it reflects that we need to keep our infrastructure in the best possible state and invest in those holdings in order to have a maximized and optimal student experience. But I also agree that we need to retain the kind of flexibility that uh, Vice President Burnett refers to because things change. We're in the middle of a strategic planning process. We may um, have opportunities arise um, uh, for real estate. We may have um, priorities that emerge from the strategic planning process. And these things um, don't always go in a perfectly prescribed sequence. So we have flexibility built into this planning process in order to reflect the potential for those opportunities um, and a commitment to you that we will come to you in the spirit of flexibility um, and receptivity to the shared governance process that will yield the best possible uh, vision and infrastructure for the campus and campuses as a whole. Thank you for those comments, uh, President Cable. I'll, uh, I'm going to ask the freshmen um, I'll give them preference in this part of the discussion. If they have questions, this is their first capital budget. There's a couple of different ways this information is presented uh, numerically and by year, and there's mixing, matching of different sources of money. Any of the newly elected members have uh, questions or comments on this, their first capital budget? Regent Mayron. Um, yes. So referring to the materials that were provided to the Regents, um, and these are, I'm looking at page 26 of the materials. This is where it lays out, this is part of the 2019 six-year capital plan project funding report. And it lays out the support for what we're going to be asking for the legislature. But then on that same page, it lays out uh, those items that would be university funded. 
The second item, item 364, is for the child and adolescent brain health. Uh, I assume that, I'm assuming that that is the institute that we are talking, we're going to be talking about when we get to the uh, possible acquisition of the Shriners Hospital location that uh, we're talking about one and the same thing to address that particular department. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Regent Mayor, and that's correct. That is the project you'll hear about later today. Okay, and there uh, is a line, we, I have we, a follow-up question. The line item is showing that the cost would be $30 million. Am I right, reading that right? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Rep, uh, Vice Regent, President, this is, um, this is just, Vice President, yes, go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Chair, Regent um, Miran, yes, this is a, um, a placeholder estimate for what um, a renovation of that building might be. We haven't yet done, we're just kind of early planning of what that might look like. So obviously it's really a range depending on how that program goes and how much money is available. We would have to right size the program and the renovation to whatever resources was chosen. But this was put in here as a um, a sense of the size of the building and what we think that renovation could be. Okay, so just so I Regent Mayor Ron. as a follow up, then so the thirty million is what you is the estimate, rough estimate of of the renovation of the if we were to go forward with the Shriners acquisition, or was that their thirty million what we thought it was going to cost to acquire a building and make it operational if we started from scratch vice president Burleson. Um, mr chair regent mayron uh, it's the estimate not of starting from scratch but from um, an estimate of what we think it w could be to renovate if we if we acquire thank you very much that answers my question and regent mayron Mayor for protocol would you um, acknowledge the chair and before addressing the the uh, presenters thank you yes, for I the questions other questions initially regent uh, davenport Thank you, Chair Beeson and Vice Presidents. Just to clarify and confirm, our um, facilities plan is staged, if you will, in the sense that what we're going forward with this year are some carryover projects that were unfunded by the legislature but remain high priorities for us. And then we kind of queued up projects for the future. Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regent Davenport, that's correct. This, the top three are the exact list we took to the legislature last year, and as you know, there was not a bonding bill. So it was our recommendation to President Gable that we keep that list, and this year we've added a couple of things to the bottom. I'll go to Regent Powell next. Thank you, Chair Beeson. <laughs> um, so, so uh, um, and thank you, thank you, presenters. Um, uh, two two questions, um, and the, the first has to do with the the, the backlog that you highlighted, um, Vice President Burleson, which you know we, which is growing just because we haven't been able to we haven't been able to to <coughs> secure the the, the the heaper funding that we need. So within within that backlog. Um, do we do we classify um, around buildings that are maybe becoming really critical um, uh, issues, either in terms of health or, or safety or regulatory? I mean, is that do we do we face some challenges like that, or do we we do we prioritize those, try to get those addressed, or do we decide you know with buildings like facilities like that to to shut them down? Or I'm, I'm just I'm a little concerned that we're you know we're going to be facing some <laughs> situations that uh, may leave us without a lot of options. And so I, I appreciate your comments on that. And then the other, just the other comment is that, you know, I appreciate the rationale for the, the priority projects. You mentioned that for the um, Twin Cities chemistry <coughs> investment, you know, that is an enrollment expander. And I, I think that, that, you know, any project that uh, as part of it, and these all have, you know, great you know, reasons in terms of the resources we need and the capabilities, but I think that when they also uh, allow us to significantly expand enrollment because we're turning kids away with the, that is a super important point uh, to make. And I think you commented 14 or 15 percent for the for the chemistry facility. And uh, you know, again, I just uh, uh, that that makes those projects, in my view, you know, very compelling. 
Um, not only do they give us the facility we need, but they allow us to bring in more students. And so just a thought. Um, Answers or comments from mm -hmm. um, the Mr. Chair. Presenters. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regent Powell. So yes, on, we agree with you on the impact to enrollment. And we know that for chemistry, it's not just for chemistry majors, of course, but there's a whole series of majors that require those chemistry classes. And um, the, the design is being built to maximize throughput, not just the number of seats, but how efficiently we can get them through. Um, as to your earlier question about priority, yes, uh, we absolutely have an interior, uh, um, a list of priorities within. So that things can be sort of identified as poor and critical shape, but within that there's priorities that go to health and safety first. You know, we certainly, if there's anything that's putting a building, we think of fire, life safety, human safety, those go straight to the top. Um, and often we don't even wait <coughs> for heap or money. We, that's what we use our internal repair and replacement dollars for to address emergencies, um, to try to state to make sure we don't leave anybody in, ever in a building we deem unsafe. So we make sure we're meeting that criteria first, um, kind of human safety, animal safety. Um, then we look to the building exterior to make sure we're keeping the, um, the outside enclosure of the building watertight because this, uh, it may not be great inside, but let's make sure we're not allowing damage, which will rapidly increase to further risk. So. The second set of categories is around the um, keeping the building tight. And then from there, you go on to all the other kind of things that you would do. So you could talk more about that, but that's in general how we do. Thank you. Regent Hsu. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Thank you, presenters. Um, as I look at this <clears throat> list, and as, as you know, I've been critical of the six-year plan in the past because uh, things tend to move around significantly, and we never really know what's going on. But um, in this particular year, um, would it be would it be uh, much work to produce a list of all the projects that kind of fell out of the six-year plan from last year, so we can assess what is actually going on? Because I, looking at last year's and and then this year's. And I see that there are some things that aren't there anymore, and I kind of want to ask, but it's kind of a long list. So if we could maybe get a list for comparison purposes that we could assess, and then maybe if you could explain why some of these things are no longer on the six-year plan, that would be helpful. But Thank you, ahead. Regent Shue. So I, maybe the way to answer that would be what are the principles behind projects falling out uh, and then we can follow up with a list later then. Um, certainly, Mr. Chair, um, Regent, we can certainly produce that list. Um, I'm trying to think in my head off which things maybe aren't there. Um, um, some things are sort of, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, some things I think maybe we're just about naming, naming differently and being a little more generic about things that still could be a specific project, but we just didn't. Um, to create a little bit more flexibility um, with the new administration um, so we could look at those things. But yeah, we can certainly create that that list um, and provide that to you. Just, oh, uh, Regent yeah, just to be clear, Mr. Chair, um, you know, there are some numbers. Uh, these are all numbered projects. And so if there's a number that no longer exists in the six-year plan mm -hmm. for 2019, I'd like to have an explanation. Understand. If it changed names, then maybe if it got included in another sure. group, then maybe 175 mm -hmm. becomes 375 or something like that. But it's, it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Regent uh, Sfigum. You've been on a number of the delivery and receiving ends of capital budgets here on <coughs> the other side of University Avenue. Um, I had some Mr. thoughts Chairman, about this. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I was known as the giver. <laughs> You're still giving. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, um, Vice Presidents, I think that this request, uh, while wow. healthy, $317 million is really a healthy request. Um, but members, I think we ought to be doing that. Um, 
very, very honestly, one, because it's needed. Uh, in fact, we could use $500 million of HEPA, not 200. We could use 500. One, because it's needed. And, and two, Mr. Chairman, because of recent history. Um, recent history last year, if you remember correctly, when we requested of the legislature <clears throat> $87 million of operation money, they arbitrarily gave us exactly half that, 43.5, if I remember correctly. So that tells me maybe if we'd have requested 97, we got 48.5. I, I don't know that for sure. It was not the way I would have operated in a previous life there. But I think because of experience of last year, Mr. Chairman, I think it's maybe telling of the a new wave of legislators or the new philosophy or whatever. And I think it's both needed and history tells us that maybe we should be asking for a healthy request. Senior Vice President Burnett. Yes, thank you, thank Chair Beeson and Regents Figum. That's exactly the conversation we had with the head of MBMB within the last couple of weeks. That they were very, they were encouraging the regions to bring forth a request of this magnitude. They feel the same issues for both us and Minnesota State, and um, I believe we'll get great support from the governor's office once we get this across to them. But so we were encouraged to bring a number and, and kind of tested this idea with them just to see what their temperature was on it, and they were very supportive of this request so echoing your comments but final comments we're just about uh, out of time on this matter I was going to go going back to Regent Mayron's line of questioning about the um, the proposed acquisition property I do there, there is a separate request in for child development building on the East Bank and maybe the presenters could address the difference between that building uh, that's the 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 mm -hmm. um, uh, the one along the river here and then the, the proposed building why well, we need two buildings and what different purpose they'll serve as we get to that maybe one of the two of you could address um, that then or or now mm -hmm. um regent uh Beeson and members um in short and then the experts will be coming up to talk about when we talk about the shriners building you'll have the two deans who can address that with great specificity if you want it more than my answer um, the project in here and for the child development building exists today. It's a whole department of the College of, um, College of Education that exists on the knoll. And that building, uh, there's actually two buildings, both in poor shape, and this state capital request will knock down one and replace that with a little bit larger building and renovate the other. So this is for the whole department. The building we're talking about for the um, uh, for the Shriner space is more of a programmatic center uh, that's more very specific. And I think I'll just maybe leave it to the deans to talk about the <coughs> unique nature of that because they're going to explain that in their presentation shortly. Great, thank you, uh, Vice President Burleson. I, I will say the campus has never looked prettier, uh, and it's I'll take it's ironic and so <laughs> that falls into your yeah. department, but. The reality, the condition of these buildings is that they're in great need. The systems are hugely expensive. There's life safety issues, there's accessibility issues. And these are real needs that we have and we're glad to see this Regents Fagum indicated a robust uh, uh, financing plan for them. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna talk about family student housing on the Twin Cities campus. And interim associate vice president McLaughlin and director Monique McKenzie, are they making their way up here? And we have today uh, half an hour. And thank you for indulging us last uh, spring when you were you were displaced off the agenda. Uh, we're glad to have you back. This is an important uh, topic, and it's going to be a new one for uh, for many many of the members. Thank you. Thank you. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Laura McLaughlin, Interim Associate Vice President, uh, Auxiliary Services. I'm Monique McKenzie. I'm the Director of Campus Planning. By the way, can everybody hear? Is there enough volume in the, uh, uh, we may need to lift the volume to the audience here? Okay. Thank you. Chair Beeson, Beeson Regents, good afternoon. We appreciate the opportunity to share an overview of our family student housing program with you today. The University of Minnesota owns two student family housing cooperatives, Como Student Community Cooperative, which will be referred to as Como 
throughout this presentation, and Commonwealth Terrace Cooperative, which I will refer to as Commonwealth. This map shows the location of each community in relation to the Minneapolis campus and the St. Paul campus. Como is highlighted in the yellow shading in the upper right corner of the Minneapolis campus map and is located on Como Avenue, directly across from the university's printing services building. Commonwealth is highlighted in yellow, the yellow shading on the St. Paul campus map and is located at the south end of the St. Paul campus on the corner of Raymond and Como Avenues. Commonwealth was built in four phases between 1954 and 1976 and is located roughly on 45 acres of property with 58 buildings on the site. The unit mix in the residential buildings consists of one, two, and three bedroom, one bathroom units with a maximum capacity of approximately 1,500 students and family members. In addition to the residential units on the site, there's also a community center, student uh, study center, and the community child care center, which also serve the community. Como was built between 1974 and 1981 and is located on approximately 17 acres of land with 13 buildings on the site. The unit mix in these residential buildings <clears throat> excuse me, consists of two and three bedroom, one bathroom units with, again, a maximum capacity of approximately 1,500 students. In addition to those residential units, an on-site community center, indoor recreation space, and the Como Early Learning Center also serve this community. In total, the two family student housing cooperatives consist of 813 rentable apartment units. Como has 357 units and Commonwealth has 456 units. Currently, rental rates in both cooperatives are approximately 37% below market rate. And historically, both communities have consistently maintained affordable below market rates while covering all costs. As this chart shows, the majority of Como and Commonwealth residents are graduate and professional students or professionals in training. Undergraduates re represent about 4 to 7 percent of residents and approximately 42 percent of residents have children, most of who are under the age of five. Both communities also house a large population of international students. Eligibility to live in the cooperatives is prioritized in the following order. Graduate professional or undergraduate students with families, individual graduate students, <coughs> professionals in training, and as space allows, individual undergraduate students who have achieved senior or junior standing. Both cooperatives have consistently maintained high occupancy rates, over 98% over the past five years. The residents living in these co-ops appreciate the family-focused environments, affordability, and convenient locations. Both Commonwealth and Como provide a variety of amenities and programs to support students and their families. The playgrounds, community gardens, community center spaces, basketball courts, soccer fields, and other such amenities are very popular and consistently are used by both adults and children. The child care centers are both accredited programs, work with ESL children, and provide discounts to University of Minnesota students. The on-site parking, there's one, also one on-site parking space per each unit. Each cooperative has a board of directors, which is comprised of residents who have been elected by residents living in that particular co-op. The board is responsible for hiring and overseeing the general manager for each cooperative and is also responsible for establishing policies and approving the operating budget and annual rental rates. Both properties are operated as cooperatives through a management agreement with housing and residential life. The management agreement outlines roles and responsibilities and is reviewed and renewed every five years. The general manager and their professional staff is responsible for managing day-to-day -day operations, including occupancy management and leasing, enforcement of policies, programming, routine maintenance and repairs, and overseeing the child care contract. Housing and Residential Life is responsible for determining capital replacement and renewal projects, establishing eligibility requirements, and replacing equipment and appliances. 
The co-ops and, and uh, university work collaboratively to determine annual rental rates based on the co-ops projected operating budgets in addition to the projected expenses incurred by the university, which include capital improvements, administrative costs, and equipment purchases. Both cooperatives have reached the end of their useful life, which at the time of construction was estimated to be 25 to 30 years. The university has historically focused on investing in capital improvements that keep the buildings functional and safe. On average, housing and residential life has invested approximately one to three million dollars annually at Commonwealth and Como to ensure that the facilities remain functional. Over the past 30 years, the, over the past 10 years, approximately 30 million dollars has been invested in the two cooperatives. These funds come from the co-op rent, resident rent. Examples of some of the recent investments include roof and window replacements, heating system upgrades, electrical system replacements, security improvements, and parking lot improvements, just to name a few. Housing and residential life has not prioritized investing in kitchen, bathroom, and other interior renovations in the residential units due to other critical facility needs. Facility condition assessments have been completed for each cooperative using the same assessment process used for all university buildings. And based on those most recent assessments, the 10-year facilities needs at Commonwealth are estimated at $86 million and at $33 million for Como. The current uh, estimated replacement value is $141 million for Commonwealth and $86.8 for Como. Balancing ongoing investment costs and affordability for students remains the greatest challenge facing the cooperatives. The long-term investment plan for Commonwealth is more complex and involves different strategies for different building types. The phase four buildings uh, at Commonwealth comprised of the two and three bedroom units were built in 1974 to 76 and are slated for continued investment. The 152 one bedroom units at Commonwealth uh, including 20 building, buildings will be taken offline and decommissioned as major building infrastructure fails. Housing and Residential Life completed a study to determine the estimated cost to renovate or replace the two bedroom split buildings, which consists of 202 units in 28 buildings. And the information from this study will assist uh, in future discussions related to the potential redevelopment of the Commonwealth site and I may have skipped over what the long-term investment plan is for Como. The long-term investment plan for Como is continued investment. Thank you. I'd like to wrap this in just a few minutes. If we could just, we're just, going to need to finish the discussion in about 15 minutes. So if you could right do this quickly, um, appreciate it. Will do. Thank you, Regent. Uh, in approximately 2017, a planning process to consider the future of the St. Paul campus was embarked upon. Uh, for those regions who were here in September 2018, a preview of those early findings was presented. This document comes from that region's presentation. We are scheduled on your work plan to uh, appear in December to give you a more detailed explanation of how we think about future of St. Paul. So with those caveats, I do want to draw your attention to what's labeled Zone 5 here on the South Campus. And this piece of the St. Paul Campus, which is the home of Commonwealth Terrace, was identified as a potential change condition as we entertain the future of the St. Paul campus. So what we know, as Lori mentioned, is that Commonwealth Terrace housing as it is today is in need of reinvestment. The original construction typology, there are no basements, it was stick built. The youngest buildings are 50 plus years old. Um, it is, uh, was built essentially on and around a lagoon. You know it today as Sarita Wetland. It was much bigger, twice the size that we know today. So the original conditions are not terribly conducive to reinvesting, and we knew that, and that's really one of the reasons it shows up in this plan. Um, when we proposed the idea of redevelopment of the Commonwealth Terrace land, the concept was a mixed-use concept. So we always anticipate that housing will go back there, that these natural features coming from Sarita Wetland and landscape would be part of the package, and that there may indeed be opportunity for retail development. None of this has been tested. It was a concept proposed. Mm -hmm. 
And we did, in fact, after we met with your board in September of 2018, go to the community in October of 2018, and we heard a lot about Commonwealth Terrace and how fundamentally important it is for graduate students for some reasons you saw in Lori's presentation, which is affordability, primarily. Location is helpful, but I would say even more important after the conversations I had with folks who live there or lived there is community. So it's a cooperative governance structure. It's sort of all your needs can be met. Child care is there. If you're a new international student with a family, it's really important to have that small scale community. So the opportunity we had to hear from the community will inform us as we go forward. Um, the concept of mixed use, uh, the concept of dedicating to an affordable housing presence is really within our sights for the St. Paul plan moving forward. So I think that's what I have for you today and I'm happy to either answer questions or we'll be back to see you in December if you prefer more detail then. Thank you very much presenters. I've had the benefit of working in this neighborhood for uh, 32 years and I've watched, um, watched the, the projects. The projects are very different um, and there's both needs uh, uh, but opportunities now uh, with the land and I think you've outlined that well and you mm -hmm. tied it back to the larger St. Paul campus planning that really needs to uh, um, come be accompanied uh, uh, with this uh, with this project. I'll open it up for comments from colleagues on this interesting project. I encourage you to drive over there too. It's about 10 minutes from the campus. Regent Davenport. Should be some, um, I'm glad to hear that we're looking at what are we going to do moving forward. I think it is important to certain segments of our student population that we have this type of community resource. Um, quick question on child care. Um, is it it's public private partnership? Is it 100% residents? Is it um, a market rate? Is it um, more affordable than market rate? Interim Associate Vice President McLaughlin. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Davenport. Uh, the, uh, the child care contract is negotiated with the co-op management. There, uh, so it is a contract held with the actual cooperatives. The uh, rates, there is a reduced rate for the students. The uh, participants do not have to live in the co-ops. They do need to be a University of Minnesota student. And the capacity in both is about 48 children. Thank you. Regent Shu. Yeah, thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, thank you, presenters. So what is the real takeaway from, from today? Is it just a kind of a update as to where we are on this stuff? Or is, is there something, com what's coming down the road? Because I have no idea what's going on with this. Uh, I might add that part. I think the, you'll see, you'll hear this again as part of the St. Paul campus plan in December, and ultimately we'll be approving that in the early part of 2020. And so the assumptions about this site on Commonwealth will probably be, soon will be contained in general, in a general way in that plan. Thank you, Vice Commonwealth. President. Sorry, Como was yeah. not part of that. Is it? So, well, they're recommending, uh, Regent Chu, the, the maintenance and continued stabilization of the Como property. It's very different. You know, it's located about a half a mile closer to campus on Como Avenue and is in, you know, has different construction and different style of architecture and such. Chief Vice President, you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As uh, Regent Beeson said at the beginning, Regent Chu, this was a holdover from last year's work plan, and we had Regent input that the one, just an update on what were the numbers, what were the challenges. As I recall, this was just a report. It wasn't for any action or, or um, from the board, but it does set the stage, and there was an intersection with the St. Paul Strategic Facilities Plan, is particularly with the, with this one part of that. So I think it was just the board asking for an update about capacity, what shape is it in, that, and so we were trying to catch up from a work plan item that was not a, we couldn't get to in the last work session. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm sorry, Regent Hart. Yes. I think I heard that you said that Como was going to be, what, was going to be closed or slated to be closed? The other one, Commonwealth. Okay, so uh, 
long term. Region Beast and Region Hurt, sorry, nothing's proposed to be closed. Okay. But the study did look at Commonwealth yeah. Terrace. How would we renew it or replace the units? Would we redevelop? So no decision's been made. It was an early concept. Okay. Yeah. And, and in line with that, long term and in line with that is, um, I wanted to hear more about um, environment and survey from the people who live there. Um, hearing that it is a needed service, do we need more of this type of housing and this type of community? And uh, helping with our thinking about the St. Paul campus, strategic planning, redevelopment. What, yeah, so going back to is, is it needed? Do we need more? Um, and the satisfaction, are we offering something that is worth investing in? Okay, thank you. Perhaps a corollary of that would be, do we need, one of our preceding board members asked me this question last year, do we need to be subsidizing it this deeply if they're only paying 38% of the market while undergraduates are paying 80% of the market? We had, if we had a high, a little shallower subsidy, we could provide more housing mm -hmm. to more mm -hmm. families. We'll want staff to address the pricing of this mm -hmm. in addition to the for the redevelopment and future planning. Other comments? Regent Paul, you or no? Just, a, just a quick one. Thanks, thanks, Chair Beeson. And I kind of following along with some of the other questions that have been asked, I'm just trying to bracket, get some sense of how to you know, think of what the range may be, what we're looking at. And very quickly, I heard I heard 36 and 86 on you know, for 120, 130 million to renovate and and it would look like 230 million to replace. I mean, is that, I mean, I know there's more work to come, but we should be thinking 130 to 250 to sort of start to move this. Okay, thank you. Perhaps, I think you indicated in the report this could be a pub, another partnership with private or nonprofit mm -hmm. developer, not just a for-profit developer. Um, people that are used to working <clears throat> co-op, Co-op structure has been successful mm -hmm. uh, in this, and being able to maintain that would be important. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, I, I know we're talking about this from a uh, finance and operations perspective. The question is more from a mission perspective. Do we, do we have data or, or feedback or anything to, that shows to, uh, student parents or married students who live here, whether then there's academic outcomes that are better than those who don't have this kind of opportunity? Um, or how does that then affect their lives as students? Interim Associate Vice President. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Kenyana, we, we do a student satisfaction survey uh, in, in collaboration with the, the co-ops and that feedback and the survey focuses primarily on the experience as well as some demographic information collected. So we have not uh, done any work around uh, looking at academic performance for students living in these two cooperatives compared to uh, graduate professional students who are living in non-university supported managed uh, cooperative style housing. So no, we have not. It's an interesting idea, and we'll certainly take note. Thank you. Student Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and going off of Regent Kenyanya's point, um, just a comment. Um, recognizing demographically, the um, first of all, the um, high percentage of residents um, at these locations who are graduate students, and then looking within graduate students, the high percentage of those who are international students and um, the different barriers and um, challenges that may be faced in terms of finding these affordable housing options, safe housing options. Um, I believe that that would also be something worth uh, potentially looking into in line with what Regent Kenyanya was suggesting as well. Thank you. Okay, I think we are, um, I think we're close to our uh, end point here. Any final comments people wish to make on family student housing called Regent Spickham. Mr. Chairman, if I could, just a very quick follow-up, Vice President McLaughlin, to uh, uh, Regent Davenport's question <clears throat> about the uh, child care contract that you said was <clears throat> contracted but not market rate. I believe that's what you said. Is that correct? 
they do get they do discount the rates for yeah. University of so, Minnesota students. Okay, and then who picks up that discount? Is that subsidy? Is that who, who, who picks up that difference between market rate and the discount? You know, I don't have the detail on that. I will <clears throat> get back to you. Well, somebody's paying something. Somebody. I hope our students aren't increasing their tuition. To no, support. it's no. I just I I will get back to you on that. It's it is a discounted rate for the students. Okay. Which means from, I believe it's from market. What the market rate would be, it's a discounted rate. Okay, and nobody, Mr. Chairman, Vice President, that that means nobody's picking up the discount. The child care provider is just giving students a a break. Uh, yes, I, I I believe it's a discounted rate that's negotiated through the contract for the students. Okay. Regent Spiga, my experience in watching the child care is separate from the from the co-op. They do fundraise around the neighborhood. Or okay. the, I thought it was that child care was all part of the co-op, Mr. Chairman. No, it is uh, the uh, services Spiga, that are provided. No, thank you. Uh, it is a separate entity mm -hmm. from from the housing co-op. Right. Okay. So nobody's subsidizing anything then. I don't know the business particulars around there, but it is a, it's a contract that they. The housing co-op has with the child care co-op and senior vice president well and we get back to you on that um it, that's that that child co-op has been around a long time as well thank you mr chairman regent Sfigum. we're not to my knowledge putting any o and m or any which would be our state support or tuition okay. into subsidizing this we can get you the financials okay. on it but it's it's not something where we're investing university's discretionary resources vice president that's all i wanted to hear we have three more minutes and Regent Simon Okay, said, thanks, Chair Beeson. I should probably know this, but I, I don't. I'm still onboarding uh, Regent Paul. Uh, but um, I'm looking at one of these pictures, and I can see where I used to live with my wife and first child. And and uh, so I assume the facility has been paid for for a long time. Okay, so the revenue that comes in through rent, even though it's subsidized or, or you know, low market rate, how is that used? How does that go back into the budget? And does, is there money kept out for restoration and stuff what we're talking about? Inter Vice President McLaughlin. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Simonson, uh, thank you for the question. The, the rents that students pay uh, cover the operating costs uh, that the actual co-op is responsible for and then the remaining 45% is uh, transferred to the university to go into the reserves for capital investments, as well as to cover some of our operating expenses that we pay for the equipment, the appliances, that type of thing. So um, the money that the students pay is going, a good portion of it is going into their reserve balances to pay for the improvements that are needed. Regent Simonson, you, you weren't there back in the day, but originally these were old Quonset huts on the site after World War II. <laughs> Regent Anderson, final comment. Uh, real briefly, when I hear that this money is going back into the accounts to pay for stoves, refrigerators, whatever, do we have an idea of what the balances of those accounts are? Associate Vice President Glock. Uh, Chair. Mr. Chair and Regent Anderson. The uh, reserve balances, I do have that. I'm just guessing, like, like Regent Simonson says, we're no longer paying a mortgage on it, so it should be accruing quite quite a bit. And when he mentioned there was 20 or $30 million of, of work to be done, I thought, oh, we're going to get that money, but maybe these balances are holding it. Yes. Uh, the reserve balances are about... Ten million, I believe. I will. I will verify that's fine. that. I, mean, I, I just wondered if that's where it's going, and yeah, it's good to know we have some money there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can staff, uh, you've been busy this fall. Congratulations on the opening, reopening of Pioneer Hall. Thank you. Please tell your staff how much we appreciate the extra work associated with getting that uh, job done uh, on budget and uh, on time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move now to uh, the dining services contract, and Vice President Bertelson will <coughs> come back up to the rostrum and table, and Director Amy Karen.
whom we haven't met before, I don't think, have we? No. Well, welcome to the Board of Regents. Please be kind. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Our bark's as bad as our bite. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but if you would introduce yourself, Director. I'm Director, Director uh, Amy Karen of Contract Administration within Auxiliary Services. Thank you. Presenters. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, um, I appreciate the uh, time today. We're here today to talk about, uh, discuss the administration's request for authorization to extend the current Twin Cities dining contract with Airmark. In order to give context for that recommendation, Director Karen and I will be covering some details on how we arrived where we are today and what potential paths forward might look like for us. And as always, the decisions on major functions like these are subject to the board review and approval. So first, to give a sense of history for the university and especially specifically on the Twin Cities campus, prior to 1998, the campus dining was self-operated as um, most in the Big Ten are of the large institutions. Um, but in July of 98, the university outsourced the residential retail and catering operations to Airmark via a competitive bid process. In 2008, after a ten, that 10 year contract uh, expired, in a new RFP, the university contracted those same services residential retail catering plus athletics concession and the Arboretum uh, to Airmark via another competitive bid for, um, that lasted for 12 years with a four year extension. In July of 2019, where we are, this we are, we are determining uh, the next steps of the Twin Cities Dining Campus and what our future is. Um, the current contract management contract extends to June 30, 2020, and as I said, has an option for four-year extension through 2024. This extension includes a variety of business units, including residential, where we have seven locations, uh, retail, which has 24 different locations, catering, which we operate as a non-exclusive requirement. Some campuses I try to make sure everybody uses it, but we're in the middle of many places. Um, we're in a non-exclusive service, but a very um, successful one, I'd say. It includes athletics as a business line, um, the nine different venues of the, of the performance sites, um, the Arboretum, which you're all familiar with, and the Bell Museum. So this includes the scope of what we provide. Um, Chair Beeson, Regents of the Board, thank you for Dr. this opportunity. Oh, I'm so sorry. No. <laughs> uh, an external consultant who surveyed our students in the fall of 2018 and asked the students to rate the location of where they ate at most frequently. A number above, here you'll see the results for our residential dining. A number above 3.0 is considered good. Our highest marks are at 17th Avenue. And with the closing of the Centennial Dining Hall and the opening of the Pioneer Hall, we expect and anticipate seeing similar improvements at this location in the future. For satisfaction in retail dining, the consultant also, also helped us look at retail. And again, 3.0 is higher, is good. And here we see that we do have a gap with the satisfaction on the St. Paul campus. So the work to date that we have done, Separate from this current process to determine our future, student engagement has been ongoing. Um, specifically following a 2017 Senate resolution, progress has been made on kosher, halal, vegan, allergen friendly, gluten free, food, food quality, food labeling, and student engagement. The biggest takeaway the biggest takeaway from the external consultants work is to um, that prior to determine the next steps, the university should articulate a campus vision to clearly establish our dining priorities, to identify the uh, program's future operating model, identify the required fi university financial return and return model, and determine the appropriate, if any, subsidy create framework for the types of investments and cost considerations for moving forward to self-operation, and then determine contract oversight to maintain as either a centralized or decentralized um, office. We aim to complete these tasks over the course of the upcoming semester and for the details of contracted versus self-operated in the upcoming year. So our consultation with stakeholders, um, food service is obviously important to everyone on campus, both those who are um, daily community members and those who visit us on, from a time to time visit. 
Here's a list of some of the stakeholders who will be consulted and engaged throughout this process. And we welcome thoughts on others that we should be in touch with. We wanted to outline for you the proposed path forward. So our general work plan, um, as Amy referred to, has two tracks. One is about what it would look like if we proceeded to contract out again with a new contract. Uh, the second path would be if we wanted to bring that into campus to self-operate. So this fall, our effort is to complete the recommended pre-work for a comprehensive standing understanding of our campus vision and our priorities. Lots of work has been done with students and they've provided lots of feedback about a variety of um, things that they believe are important and that will be a great place for us to, to work from. Now we think the next step is how do we turn that into an organized set of priorities um, based on different evaluations and how to successfully put that in a, a strong RFP process. This spring and summer then we take that and build that RFP and in our, by the time we issue the RFP, we also have to finalize some of the business lines we talked about, the athletics, Arboretum, and Bell, to know if they want to be part of that same RFP again or if they want to pursue a different course. So we're in conversations with each of them. Um, in the same, while we're building that RFP, at the same time we'll be preparing and doing benchmarks and comparing um, what our, what what an outside RFP structure would look like versus what it would be take for us to rebuild a new program in-house. So we'll be gathering and building perform and a business plan and operational plan for that so that by the time we complete the RFP and are ready to review it next fall, we'll have those comparisons. That's when we'll pick the path forward, in which case if we decide to contract out, we'd be ready to start that by July 1st of 2021. But if we decided to self-op, that would it would take a little longer. There's more steps um, to accomplish that. Then we would start that process then in July 1st of 2022. Therefore, the request for up to two years, but not necessarily two years. So again, our recommended um, action um, is to undertake a thorough process. We need some time to do that. Although we had an existing four-year contract extension available, uh, we've chosen not to pursue that and instead are asking for up to two-year extension that we would um, review today and hope, ask you for action on in um, October with some <laughs> final recommendation from us about which pathway to take um, late 2020. Part of it that um, priorities and assumptions that we have to build in the conversation with the campus community and ultimately with your input is what, um, how to balance all those different priorities and assumptions. And you can see some of those metrics that we have to figure out how to balance. Uh, what should be the priority for cost and affordability of students in the community relative to the price and quality of food, the hours of operation, the number of venues, the variety of food choices, how much those food sources should be done locally and sustainably, all things that cost money versus the affordability and how do we balance those things um, we have some draft ideas about that um, that we will be working on with a variety of people. What wanted to ask, uh, this is the slide we'll be stopping with to see if you have any input for us. You know, we believe that every stu person studying or working on campus should have access to food within some sense of distance or time. We believe that all contracts should have a central oversight of those contracts, however that's done. Um, we believe that there have to be some financial expectations for each of those business lines, not necessarily on every particular site. There may be some cross subsidies there, but each business line has to have a clear financial outcome and direction. Um, we think that you know, a target for us to be in, in the, the, the half of the Big Ten that's the most affordable for room board is, is the right target. Right now we're the second most affordable room and board in the Big Ten out of 14. Um, there may be some room in that, but we, we believe that that might be a good target. But these are things for us to talk about. Um, and with that, um, we're going to leave the slide here and then end our presentation and take any questions you have or listen to any feedback or advice you have for us as we enter into this process. Thank you, presenters. I'll also like to acknowledge the receipt of communication from uh, the, uh, the uh, students who are the primary customers of this service. And uh, uh, they will be. Uh, um, key stakeholders as we go into this um, next month. Um, this is another review item. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask Regent Simonson here at your hand first for a question or comment. Yeah, just quick. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Beeson. Um, 
I was looking, I, I received an email, I know other regions did too, at some time from a student group, quite critical of this service. And I'm trying to find it, and I can't find it, but I think it, I think it went to uh, quality and healthy food, or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, on your scoring system, those are a little bit lower too. So I'm just wondering if that's something you're looking at. And as you go to renew this contract, are you talking about it? They were really quite critical. I wish I could find it, but I can't. Vice President Bergelson. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Regent Simonson. Um, so one thing I know is that when it comes to food, it's uh, difficult to make uh, 50,000 people happy. Um, um, I think certainly um, we believe and are listening to the feedback of students. And since I've been in this role, we've spent a lot of time trying to listen to and uh, um, use that um, critical feedback uh, and be constructive. So we have, I think, made, um, responded with um, for the last couple of years with a series of improvements, which we think are helpful, but certainly not done. Um, there's certainly room for improvement. Uh, there's um, and we work with contract management, uh, Amy's group, to oversee and provide that same advocate, frankly, and um, push our contractor to improve in all those areas. So um, we track those, those metrics um, that you saw on an annual basis. We are continue to push for them to get better. Um, we certainly know that there are, uh, is room for improvement, and that's one of the reasons we chose not to um, automatically exercise a four-year extension. Um, and we want to um, advance the process for um, determine and be for the campus what's the best thing to do. Um, we just want to make sure we take the right amount of time, not too much, but the right amount of time to make sure we do it right because these contracts come, as you saw, about, about every 10 years. There's no quick turnaround. The amount of entry effort is so great that it takes these contractors a very long time to enter into it. And if we choose to self-operate, it could be much longer than 10 years. So um, we feel like this is a, a, a very significant point in time for us. Um, and we take those that feedback very seriously. And um, in fact, for the governance structure we've created, we have, we're working with student leaders to identify a, a student advisory committee, which would be core to the governance of the the, both receiving the feedback and developing the RFP over time. Thank you. Mr. Langworthy, would you send out a copy of that letter to the board again in case some haven't seen that? I appreciate it. Regent Davenport. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson and Vice President and Director. If I may first echo, not to put words in your mouth, Regent Simonson, but your advocacy for healthy and varied food choices. Um, but my question is around uh, employees. Mm -hmm. And I imagine this um, uh, contemplation about change could be worrisome. And are you, do you have a plan for um, updating or FAQs, frequently asked questions, or just some kind of uh, pro progress, um, progress in telling them where you're at with this? Mm -hmm. um, because I think it could be concerning if employers might be changing, contract changing and that, so that they're up to date? Vice President Burleson. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Regent Davenport, um, the short answer is yes, and then I'll exp expand upon that. So one, just to make sure people are aware, we have a, a somewhat unique situation that we contract out the management of the program. So the Airmark is just provides the management of it, but all the um, students, workers and all of the frontline staff who provide the food service program are university employees, our Teamsters. So they work for us. And so though we contracted out the management of it, we've never contracted out the employees. Um, so I think your point is right, that as we get through this process, um, keeping the, um, the staff who are doing that work up to date uh, about how, what the process is and how it proceeds is an important one for us to do. Um, how, you know, the, the details about how to deal with all those components is uh, we are not yet to that place. Thank you. That's good. We're going to, I think you've answered the question. Regent McMillan. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. I, I was struck when we were over at Pioneer. Would you speak up a little louder, over, Regent that? McMillan? Yeah, is that better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. 
I was uh, I, I couldn't help but uh, notice when we were at Pioneer a couple of uh, weeks ago for that grand opening about the the impact on choices certainly and ability to deliver different qualities and a range of food that that's going to have on our certainly our first year students and some of them who live here there as we get into second and third year students can you help me and the board appreciate what bringing Pioneer online with that modern dining facility, I think in my remarks I said something about 10,000 meals a day potentially, that looks and feels a lot like 17th Avenue, and it looks like it will deliver to the admit to you and the Aramark the ability to address at least some of the concerns the students seem to be raising around quality, choices, range, you know, all those things. So. If you presented on that, I missed it. I'm sorry, but it seems to me that's a factor that's going to improve your ability and or error marks ultimately, but it gets to a core of some of what they're raising, doesn't it? Vice President. Um, Mr. Chair and Regent McMillan, um, in short, absolutely there will be a big impact. What we can see from even on this re the surveys is capital infrastructure makes a big, big difference in the kinds of choices that we can provide and the outcomes that people have, their satisfaction. You provide a better environment, you put better infrastructure, you can provide better food, better choices, um, and there's a very strong correlation between the two. Regent Powell. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Chair Beeson. Just a few quick questions, trying to get a sense of the dimension. Do we have any idea of roughly what percentage of the meals, you know, that are served each day for the entire community are are provided by this this service. I mean, I, I don't know if it's third, a half, or all, but just some sense of of what what the what the numbers of meals are. And, and I, I'm assuming that this is sort of where most people are getting their food from, but I don't know. And then the other question, along with that, is has the you know has the operation is it expanded over over the years? Is it declining? I mean, or is there any any clues to be had from just kind of the demand um, in the community? Presenters. Director. Chair Beeson, um, Regent Powell. So as far as it goes, um, the number of student meals, we'll have to get that exact number back to you. But for example, um, we have around 6,000 students that live in residential life. So if they're taking two to three meals, that you know is around 18,000 meals. And then as far as it goes for retail, I don't have that information. And again, we'll get that information back to you. And then in regards to your second question, um, if you could repeat that for me. Well, I'm just trying to get a sense for whether we're seeing, you know, is demand increasing? I mean, I suppose it is because we're adding facilities, but is, are there any sort of signals from this, you know, in terms of buying signals that say we're less happy sure. and to, to kind of reflect the critical memo? Um, we could see um, for residential dining, that's pretty much the same. Um, as far as it goes for retail dining, we're seeing a decline in the retail dining just due to the building up of the community space that's around the campus. Um, there's many more restaurants and options that are available than there were um, 10 or 20 years ago. And then as far as it goes, um, we did benefit from having the Minnesota United play here and, and also the Vikings. But um, again, there's only so many football games that happen in a year and only so many events. So. Um, and a lot of it just depends upon attendance for the athletics portion of it, too. So the business is growing, but it's not growing as much as we anticipated it to grow. Um, but again, that's a lot of it's due to the buildup in the city area. Okay, thanks. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Uh, VP Brittleson, if you could go back two slides. Um, this proposed path forward. When I look at the slide, it... It actually makes a lot of sense. The the plan, the the order, gathering feedback, the um, it's not rushed. Um, the only thing that seems out of place are the years. Um, I feel like this process should be ending now, not starting now. Um, in terms of this was a 12-year contract, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding, but I imagine in a 12-year contract, these conversations would be happening in year nine, year ten. Um, and this is all within the context of all the feedback and the conversation that's been happening around campus on this. Um, what the students have been saying, Regent Simonson um, referenced that letter, and then there was the recent one that Chair Beeson referenced that I also got a copy of. And I just, I guess I wonder why we're doing this now in the position we're in, and extensions 
obviously going to need to be necessary, but it seems to me like this is a process that should be ending now and we should be making our decision, not needing to extend and then therefore go through this process. I'm not sure if that I can is a question, but it that. certainly is a comment. Any wish to make any response? Maybe. Um, Mr. <coughs> Chair and Regent Kanyanya, I, I appreciate that uh, feedback and I uh, feel some re certainly some responsibility for not have been uh, anticipating or start maybe having should have started sooner. So that, I think that's a fair criticism. I will say that we certainly have started, we have been talking about this for some number of years, trying to anticipate and think about what are the variables. Um, and that we had had, um, frankly, we had hired a consultant, we've referred to a couple of times with the anticipation that that would help be prepare us for the, um, to launch. And one of the feedback though we got from that was there were more things that, um, more fee a variety of feedback from that said we, felt that we needed more time and more clarity than we had to had. And so that's, uh, you know, that's good criticism toward me that we should have been more prepared. So there's sort of an, a one year extension, that's sort of one reason of it. The second year potential extension is really about a shift that we had, when we started this, we were not considering the idea of um, putting self-operation into the mix. And that, that's really the thing that provides a whole nother year beyond what we had imagined. So the first part of it, was about um, kind of new things, needing more clarity and more work to be fully prepared. And I think that's a fair criticism. The second part I'd say is um, adding another variable to the mix. Thank you. I'm gonna ask, uh, or just the, again, almost everybody around the table wants to speak here, Regent Shu. It'll be oh. shorter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, presenters. Uh, this this is a very interesting topic, and as uh, Regent Kenyanya says, it has been around for a while. And I just recently requested a copy of the contract, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet because I got it a few days ago, and it's 277 pages. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated issue, complicated contract, I'm sure. Um, I, I do have a question for Chancellor Black, who is paying attention back there. Um, yes, sir. Regent Black, <laughs> Council Black. Ch Chancellor attention. Black, could you tell me how, uh, roughly how many students are you feeding on your campus? Because you, you are a self-operated uh, system, right? Yeah. <coughs> Chancellor Black will come up to answer the <laughs> processes. The, always be there's food for thought for that, right? <laughs> I'm glad I was awake, paying attention. <laughs> I always have. I always have <laughs> before. <laughs> uh, Chair Beeson and uh, Regent Shu, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but I can give you some approximations. Uh, we currently have about 3,100 students living on campus at UMD, and so our dining facilities, uh, student dining facilities, are focused on serving those students. So the, those that 3,100 is, those are regular participants. We also, as, as I'm sure you've seen on our campus, have a fairly active uh, food court and other dining options for students as well as for uh, staff and faculty. So I, I can't give you exact numbers. Uh, we're currently have around 11,000 students at UMD, about 1,900 employees. Uh, and I can tell you the dining facilities are, are well used by students, uh, faculty, and staff. Okay. And I'm, I, we actually found another 10 minutes in the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Langworthy. So we've got a oh, real okay. follow-up, so one more follow-up on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know I've always had a good meal up there, and uh, you do a fine job with the uh, uh, self-operated uh, facilities. And I, I'm hoping that we can learn something from, at least the Twin Cities campus can learn something from UMD in terms of how you guys are doing things. Um, so thank you very much. And I would just say that um, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring this whole thing out because uh, I did re receive a one-page summary from Jason. I don't know if everybody received it or not yet. But it, it's interesting how, how um, Airmark is actually paid in this this process, and I'd, I'd like to actually have an exercise where we follow the money around a little bit to see exactly how, how this whole thing works and who's paying who and on what. You know, I remember when we opened the Athletes Village um, 
food service, you know, we were originally promised that we were going to do all these all these things that I don't think we ended up doing. Um, Aramark had a right of first refusal on that contract, as I recall, and and actually took that contract. But um, in terms of flexibility, I think in the future we need to think about, you know, if we do need something different for athletics, for example, that that's actually built into the contract so we can actually do those things uh, separately from, you know, the vendor who's going to provide those services. So those are just some comments. Um, I'm sure as we dig into this, there's more, um, more information, more questions um, to be had. But I, I do think, you know, another two years to study this and to, you know, possibly make a, make a transition it seems like a long time given where we are and where, what we've known. And the last thing um, I want to say is if you could go back to the slide that um, has the survey results. For residential or retail, Regent? Uh, the other one. Residential. Yeah, so the residential dining, if, if I look at those ends, they seem really small in terms of like, are you, in, are you like interviewing a few people yeah. <laughs> at each location like on one day or you know, I don't know how you got this data. I don't know if this is out of 10 points or out of five points. You know, certainly if it's out of 10, three doesn't seem that great. If it's out of five, you know, three might be great, but I don't even see a four on here. So I don't, I don't really know kind of how, how well these students um, are rating the, the service. Mm -hmm. Chair Beeson. Director Herons. Chair Beeson and Regent Chu. Um, the scale is on a one to five scale. And the survey was sent out to all of the um, campus community, so it was sent to the student, staff, and faculty. And one of the questions that was on the survey was to ask, which location do you take your meal at most frequently? And so to show us some results in regards to the individual locations, this is how many people specified or students specified that they ate at this location. Okay, and this, this says fall of 2018, which, Correct. Is, which is a year ago. and. But most of our users, most of the people who live in our residence halls only live there for one year. So Correct. every year we're getting kind of a new group of people telling mm -hmm. us how, how they like it. And I think, you know, if the numbers are basically the same, then, you know, I don't see a, a need to continue, although the, the numbers of people participating seem small to me. Thank you. Uh, I'm, you'll take that mm -hmm. comment under advisement. Uh, I'm going to move along to or others to have a chance to speak. Um, and I have down next Rita Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be fairly quick here. I, first, I want to say that um, I'm pleased to hear that, uh, this, that this January, when the students from the other three dorms eat it, Pioneer, when they <laughs> finally thaw out, they'll have good food options to, uh, to enjoy after not having to travel there that way. But um, I, I am not real clear yet, and, and this is something I haven't had a chance to really look at. Uh, when we made that change, how does that change the, the contract with Aramark? Because we made a pretty substantial investment that I think was going to yield some savings by consolidating the, the food service there. And so I'm interested how that was impacted and how certain other investments like that would be impacted as we go forward. Um, Mr. Chair, what I, what I, I think I will, will ask for, um, maybe a chance to get a, a, a briefing in between now at this meeting and the next meeting. I waited till after this presentation to see if maybe some more of the light bulbs would, would, uh, would come on, but there I still have some questions that we probably won't get to today, but uh, if I'm able to do that, uh, to have a, a more thorough understanding. I, I would like to share my basic perspective um, on the student role in this, proce in this process going forward. Um, first, I, I, my understanding is that the, the you know, Ratings aside, I, I think it's well run. I think I, I've gotten feedback from sort of rank and file students that food service is good. Um, generally, obviously, you're going to get a range of opinions on that. Um, but the, the challenge is, and you know, sort of in life generally, it's it's unusual to be captive to a certain you know food option where you're paying for it in advance and that's where you go. You know, as opposed to you know voting with your feet um, with your food uh, dollars. And so the, the, you know, the market forces to assure quality are unusual. They're, they're somewhat limited compared to um, the, the general economy. And, and so I think it's important that students have a great deal of input. I don't really know how else you, you sort of replace that, that market background. And so I think that the students have been very polite 
um, my observation in this uh, conversation about how they're going to um, participate going forward. And, and so I will support a, a robust process for ensuring that students have an opportunity to provide um, uh, a lot of input into the operation of, and the oversight of this contract going forward. So as we get ready to go into the, the voting phase, I, I just want to be clear that um, that's important to me. I think it's important to the fidelity to the, the actual consumers who are going to be in, in you know, consuming this food over their collegiate careers. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rocha, Regent Mayron. Thank you, Regent Beeson. In terms of uh, the stakeholders that you've identified that you intend to consult with or have or, or will in the future, I would suggest if it isn't part of your plan that we are always looking at what our best practices and what are other institutions of higher education doing who supply food, whether it's the Big Ten, private, public, uh, food is always uh, very important to mm -hmm. anybody who's wants to eat and so it's always a hot button and I think we we ought to be able to take advantage of what other institutions are doing and those who are perceived to be most successful in providing good food quality food for their students so I'm hoping you're going to be accessing that information mm -hmm. as well as you look at the path that we should go mm -hmm. thank well, you thank you um, we will Regent Kenyon and then student representative you're gonna get the final um, talking points here, so if you could hold for one second, Regent. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted a second Regent Roche's remarks, that's all. Yeah. Student Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair and presenters. Um, uh, to go off of uh, previous comments, um, resonant comments from uh, earlier in the discussion, I just want to um, bring up again how embedded dining services are into the social experience um, of students and their well-being, um, particularly when they're in situations um, in residence halls where um, they, there is um, a, um, an expectation and a um, framework in place where they are expected to be um, buying into this dining, uh, dining plan. Because um, students aren't just studying on campus, they're um, living here relying on these dining services every day. So it follows that um, students' concerns about um, dining experiences actively impact their holistic experience here at the university. And the decision um, here um, with the contract process has ramifications for, uh, for tens of thousands of students. And students have eagerly been awaiting uh, the discussion here before the board. And students also should, um, are curious about being in this position that uh, Regent Kenyanya had mentioned about there being an extension of the contract when students, um, the student momentum has been persistent uh, for years through various um, advocacy channels, and that then there have been external consultants brought in uh, to evaluate dining. Nevertheless, we're looking forward to how student engagement will con continue to be integrated throughout the process. Um, students appreciate the integration um, of their feedback thus far. And um, for example, um, I had the um, opportunity earlier this spring to be in a listening session uh, with Director uh, Kieran back um, here on the Twin Cities campus. And um, I have a question and then a comment. Um, my, so the question um, is that a strategic approach is going to be necessary for um, effectively fostering good and solid student engagement on this um, moving forward in the decision-making process. And I'd like to know how you would um, intertwine the student feedback that's already that already exists, that's already been collected, and move that forward into a productive student-minded uh, student uh, decision-making process. Presenters, who would um, like to sure. answer um, that question? Uh, Mr. Chair and um, Mr. Kraft, I'd say there's a couple of things. One, I think you're right, we want to utilize the work that's already been done, and how do we help turn that into um, sort of the next stage that prepares us and moves us forward as opposed to recycling existing work. So I think the, you know, we both had the MSA had done uh, a report. Um, recently we got uh, a memo from um, COGS. Um, so our, we've been, met with some students over the summer and have now are working with student affairs and each of the student organization leaders to appoint someone to a student advisory committee, which will be 
um, a central part of the governance for this whole program. And um, we anticipate using them sort of as a, um, a, a common and consistent part of the planning as well as feedback. How we take that other information when we're trying to build a website and a place to show historical information, we think that might be, that could be one of the things that provide context for the student body and for the campus to uh, look at where we are and what we want to look at. Second, when as um, we're looking for those groups to help us figure out the variety of um, what are all the tools we want to use and how to best use them. So we're anticipating, we're planning for and have draft kind of agenda for a series of focus groups, a survey, um, as well as open, open forums, um, and maybe even other tools that we haven't thought of so far. Um, those are the ones we sort of put on the table as draft. Um, we are um, building a timetable and actively scheduling now the first meeting of that larger group to, with a um, sort of a seminar for us all to be educated and, and caught up in the same place. There are a lot of ideas and needs identified in the previous studies. Um, for now, I think the next step is how do we prioritize across all those needs? So when you score an RFP, you ultimately have to prioritize one thing over another. And how do we establish those priorities? And I think that they gave us a good list that will say these are the things that are important. How do we, how do we balance those needs? Um, because um, they can't all be equal. And so that's what we, that think, that's how we want to build off what has been done and take it to the next step because that will lead to a successful RFP. Mr. Chair, may I follow up and final comment? Yes, question. thank you. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. thank you, VP Bertelson, for your uh, for your response. Um, and going off of that, staying true to the principles of shared governance, what makes this university in many ways unique, um, and recognizing the far-reaching breadth of dining operations, how many students they impact, and how um, how centrally they impact them throughout their time here at the university. Thinking about how the feedback that's gathered from students is intertwined with the decision-making process um, mm -hmm. beyond forming the foundation for uh, the initial stages of the process. Um, students hope that there's an expectation set that um, beyond a consultation sort of role that these um, conversations can lead to student representation, uh, student voice represented in, um, in the process moving forward, including the advisory committee, but um, looking beyond that as well underst and um, understanding across the sort of lifespan of this decision-making process uh, that there should be student representation, a student voice at the table, given how, um, how integral this is to students and how massive of a stakeholder they are. Thank you. On that note, I'm going to recess the board until 3:50. We have a lot of work left to do, so if we could be, um, uh, if we could be um, timely with our return. Thank you, presenters. Thanks for the input. Thank you, audience, for showing up today out of your uh, day on this matter. Maybe later. We'll stay in recess. You're treating you. Sticking on. Good show. We'll resume the meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the Board of Regents, if the audience would take their seats. And we will proceed on the agenda here. And we have some real estate transactions to talk about today. We've given that about 45 minutes. And then we have a consent report uh, matter and a couple information items we're gonna finish by five o'clock or before five o'clock. So good afternoon, uh, Dean Quam and Dean Toller and staff here today. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Kruger, thank you. So let's start it out uh, with uh, with the uh, Shriners property. I think where is how we're going to start today. Is that right? Okay. Presenters. Thank you, Chair Beeson, members Listen, of the committee. <coughs> Today we are here to present to you the review of the proposed acquisition of 2025 East River Parkway, otherwise known as Shriners Hospital. I will start the presentation by providing a brief overview of the, of the property. 
and then Vice President Toller and Dean Kwam will then highlight the strategic value of the property to the university's mission. And then I will conclude the, pro the presentation with details of the proposed transaction. The current Shriners Hospital is located approximately one mile from the Minneapolis East Bank campus on 10.2 acres of land along the Mississippi River near the border of St. Paul. The facility was constructed in 1991 to serve the orthopedic needs of children in a family-centered environment. The facility consists of a 103,500 square foot two-level building, which includes inpatient hospital rooms, an outpatient clinic, as well as support facilities. Attached to the main facility are a 14,000 square foot hospital, uh, hotel and conference facility, as well as a 172 space parking ramp. Here are a few photos of the exterior of the facility. And in considering the acquisition of any property, we begin by asking what is the strategic value to the university? And with that, I will turn it over to Vice President Toller and Dean Kwam to speak to this question. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Regents, President Gable. Uh, it's a nice building, first of all. <laughs> I work there as an ICU physician in the intensive care unit, and it's in a very good shape. It's in a very good place. It's quiet. It's where families with children and adolescents that have mental disorders would like to go. They don't want to go to campus. They want to go there. The vision for this is, however, absolutely unwavering focus on what matters to Minnesotans, what matters to this community. And I would say there are very, very few things that are as valuable as mental health. There are very few things that we are the top in the world. This is one of them. And as you were putting together these paper oligonucleotides over the lunch in the genomic center, you passed the Center for Magnetic Resonance. So that's where uh, we are, again, on the top of the leadership in the world, that we can deliver to the Minnesotans the knowledge that's there. If you saw about two years ago in the Weissman Museum, the drawings of Ramonica Hall, who got Nobel Prize for this, you would remember, or I can share with you now, that in contrast to other tissues of the body, the brain does not really calculate the number of cells. It's not like bone or liver. It calculates a number of connections. And these connections, since we were born, are increasing as the number of the cells is decreasing. Now, that building that you passed in the biodiscovery district is the one that for the first time in the history of the human medicine mapped these connections in adult brain. Now, we have what nobody else has. We have been able to map these connections as they grow. This is the fourth dimension, time, emerging connectivity in development. We do it on the babies. We call it baby connectome. We don't harm any babies. They go sleep at 8 o'clock at night, and we measure these connections over the first three years of their lives. We also have an insight into another critical period of life, which is adolescence. And that's where we are looking at children that are nine years and older, and we are looking at how these connections are made and preserved through the adolescence. So this is the substrate for why this is a strategic thought you know, for this university. Because neuroscience, which this is a part of, is a, one of the three priorities for the medical school. It is a priority for the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs. It is the priority as a mental health of President Gable. If you've seen the strip op ed and, you know, and things that she has said, this is something that our students and our community absolutely want to have and, and, and deserve. Now, when I look at the epidemic nationally, and as you were coming through this building on the, on the, on the, on the main floor, you have you know, hopefully seen these posters. This is medical discovery team on addiction. Addiction is an epidemic. Addiction is a part of what we are talking about because what you have in aggregate is anxiety, lack of sleep, depression, suicide, addiction, all this in conglomerate that are typically a result of a 
not always, but typically a result of an experience in early childhood, which is called adverse childhood experience. It can be divorce, death of a parent, uh, parent in jail, uh, a number of different things, injury, leukemia in childhood, my, my job. And uh, that's where you know, we can actually recover some of that function. So the strategic initiative that is asked of us, you know, this is one of these very many extramural tasks that the universities such as ours are being asked on which the well-being of the state depends. Fix the mental health. So if you look at this, we have done this wrong. We went to war with the wrong army. Because what we are looking at is we are putting these people you know, into the rooms, we are putting them on medication so that they don't disrupt, and instead what we should be doing is what we have done in infectious disease and partly in cancer, which is we are preventing this from happening. So the first two critical periods in life are the first thousand days of life and then the adolescence. So when I take my 10-month-old granddaughter to the Children's Museum on Saturday, it's just some days, uh, she doesn't do much. You know, she does these little things that kids do. But the important thing, that the most important part of her brain development is happening at that time. So with, you know, Exiperi uh, from The Little Prince, what is essential is invisible. You don't see it until 10 years after, 20 years after. And yet, the way to intervene is at that time in these two critical periods. So what we need to do is to, I think, elevate that mixture of nature and culture and, and grasp you know, what needs to be done in the first 1,000 of days, then focus the, on the adolescence. You probably you know, can appreciate the gravity of the problem by a simple statistic, which is the number two cause of death in age group 10 to 34 is suicide. Number one is accident. So, and this is increasing. So if we want to get ahead of this, we better do this differently than others. We better do it by preventative ways. Can you advance? <laughs> and <laughs> we better do this in a smart way that will make this university proud. This Generation X that is most affected by this, these are the children and adults that are born after 1995, they are really the focus of, 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 of this attention and their families, of course. So if you are... Uh, you know, I watched with my children in 1990s, these wonder years. This is exactly the period of the wonder years. This is where these things are shaped and advanced, you know, into something that, that really matters. So the vision and the strategic alignment with the mission of this university is on the priority of the medical school, priority of the university, our unique ability to provide what nobody else can. We are the only game, you know, in this, you know, for now, for some, you know, open period, and deliver on what the community is asking of us. Mr. Chair, I would like to hand over to my much more brilliant Dean Kwam. You may. Welcome, Dean Kwam. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Beeson and President Gable and um, Regents. I. Um, I have been honored to be a partner with um, Dean Tolar in this project. Um, I was just sharing with him that as somebody who drove to Shriners Hospital probably 30 years ago with my father, who was a Shriner at the time and who was sponsoring a young child to come to Shriners Hospital for treatment, which is what the Shriners did for years with the Shriners Hospital. It's a very emotional place for, I think, the people of Minnesota and the surrounding area. It, it has meaning as a hospital. Um, it has meaning as a place that is welcoming to families, and I think that's really what we're looking for. Um, we're in the College of Education and Human Development. We are very excited to be sponsoring um, the projects that will go into the Institute for Child and Adolescent Brain Health. Um, one of the things that I think is exciting is we have some of the best, most extraordinary faculty in the world who we have a chance to get together in this institute. And in fact, we have just, with the help of Dr. Tolar, have um, recruited a couple to come here, one of whom will help to lead this effort um, in a very competitive process. Um, he'll be 60% time with us and 40% time in the medical school. I, I think that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. We're going to be recruiting even better 
um, more exciting faculty, postdocs, graduate students. This will be the place to come in the world if you want to study child and adolescent brain health. And, and that is just, has created an excitement that I haven't seen for a long time. Um, so we're really bringing together, you can see on the slide, um, faculties, many of them who are regents professors uh, from the Institute on Community Integration, the Institute for Translational Research in Children's Mental Health, uh, the Institute for Child Development, which is the best child development program in the country, um, Center for Neurobehavioral Development, Psychiatry, Pediatrics, and Rehabilitation Medicine. Um, I will say, um, if you want to go to the next slide, that this, is, this really will be a world-leading epicenter of early brain development. I think one of the most exciting things that I think about is when I think about a family that's coming to the University of Minnesota for help with a child or an infant, a toddler, who they're very concerned about, they're trying to figure out how to drive into the Twin Cities, this is a much easier place to get to. They can, they can um, be seen in multiple clinics in one location. We have the best imaging in the world, um, and we'll have those facilities available to those families. I think this is a, a great gift to the state of Minnesota and, and actually to the region. So we're very excited to be a partner in this with the medical school. Region. I'm sorry, yes. Chair Buson, Lesson, Regents yeah. of the committee, now I get to follow up with the brass tacks of the actual real estate transaction. The details are as follows. The purchase price is $22.5 million with $250,000 of refundable earnest money. We are currently in the 160-day due diligence period, which ends on December 9th, and which is why we are before you today for review and action in October, rather than reviewing in October and acting in December. The purchase is contingent upon the University and Shriners success successfully negotiating a lease back of the facility to Shriners through July 2020 in order for them to complete construction on their new facility in Woodbury. They will have an option to renew this lease through the end of the year and through the end of 2020 in case of any unforeseen delays due to, <coughs> to their occupancy in the new facility. We have begun the, our due diligence process with our standard protocol. <coughs> We have, the, per university policy, we have had two appraisals conducted on the property, and the purchase price is consistent with those two. We have also contracted for independent facility condition assessments and environmental assessments. The results of these will be highlighted during our October presentation. A major component of our due diligence is the capital project pre-design. Prior to pursuing the real estate opportunity, the university conducted a feasibility analysis to identify the programmatic needs and basic space requirements of the program, and these continue to be refined and are key to determining whether the facility will be ultimately able to meet the program at the appropriate construction price that was discussed as part of the six-year capital plan earlier. We have had, we will have additional information and on the pre-design available at the, during our presentation in October. You may recall that at the board's May review of the annual capital budget, then President Kaler highlighted this capital project on the list of potential additions to the annual capital budget. At the time, he noted that the university was pursuing the potential real estate opportunity, but could not offer any details given that the proposals had just been due only a week before and Shriners was in the process of evaluating those proposals. And so during our feasibility analysis, the preliminary cost of the renovation of the facility was estimated between 27 and $33 million. We will complete the pre-design to further understand the renovation's needs in the, context of this, in the context of this facility condition assessment. If the real estate acquisition is approved in October, we will proceed with additional design work in order to return to the regions for a capital budget amendment and schematic design review later in FY 2020 in order to be ready for construction when the Shriners vacate the facility. And now for the financing strategy. Given the compelling nature of the work of the proposed Institute on Child and Adolescent Brain Health, as Dean Toller and Dean Kwam addressed, uh, there is the opportunity for donor participation in the facility. The university intends to fundraise for the acquisition and construction costs and is making pos positive steps in that, in that direction already. Annual building operating costs are estimated at $3 million and will be paid for by the units within the facility. 
And with that, we conclude our presentation. Thank you, presenters. Anybody here from Shriners? I, if so, I'd like to just acknowledge them as a friend of the university and thank them for bringing this opportunity for us to consider. Well, if they're listening, um, I, again, our readings uh, here from the university and thank you. Okay, we have questions and comments. I'm sure there's a lot of interest in this project. Who would like to start this off? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> sure, Paul. So thank you, um, thank you, Chair Beeson, and thank you, um, presenters. So I, I want to just I want to make sure I understand a little bit the you know, sort of the sequencing that, and the thought involves around the fact that our, our capability in this area and our interest in this area clearly precedes, precedes of the availability of, of this building, you know, which, I, and the opportunity came up relatively recently. Uh, and so um, can you maybe, uh, Dr. Toller, if you can talk a bit, and Dean Kwan, talk a bit about um, how you know how this opportunity has sort of advanced, catalyzed your thinking, you know, whatever, and then maybe describe a bit, a bit more. The way I understand it, this is both would be a, cl a clinical care center, I mean, a patient care center with a number of beds, plus plus would combine uh, many of the elements of research that we're already active in. But so I just want to get a sense for how the, you know, how how this fits in with longer term strategy which which would have preceded this if this didn't come along i'm assuming that you would have been coming forward at some point recommending that we build a building or i want to just sort of get a, get a feel for the role of the building and then and then if you can just a, a affirm the kind of resource resource it would be again both clinical care and research i'm assuming but maybe a little more definition around that the questions dean toller chair Beeson. Brilliant, Paul, excellent question. So what I look at here is not dissimilar for other things that we do in clinic, in scientific realm, in technology. There's a lot of, there's a great demand. This demand has been growing, you know, over decades in, in mental health. 42, patient care. Patient care. Students at this university, 42% of them, do, you know, have diagnosable mental disorder. That, you know, if you, if we sit back, that redefines what normal is, right? Because this is a sizable population of students that are not gonna perform well at our university because of some limitations and constraints that anxiety, sleepy disorder, whatever that is, thought processing brings about. This has increased in the last 15 years. You know, this is like the, the Boyton visits, you know, have doubled over the last several years. So this is a emerging problem. Now, the science that's behind this, that has been going on regardless of, you know, what this societal need is. But it's a raw material, if you will, that has been catalyzed now by the societal need to do something and not just repeating the, the old uh, forms, you know, and old solutions of, of, of the past. So this building came at a perfect timing, you know, and some things, you know, in, in life, you know, are idiosyncratic, are random, you know, and this is one of them. But the closure, the catalytic closure that I think appeared obvious to some of us, to Dean Kwam, myself, others, with this building, this is so beautifully arranged in this, again, quiet, not too distant from campus, having a family rooms, you know, 10 overnight beds, 19 exam rooms, you know, absolutely it, it, as if you wanted to design this, you would probably design something like this. So it is an opportunity, you know, that, that comes, you know, uh, once a decade, I think, uh, but an opportunity that has been reflected or reflecting on the societal need, societal need that has been growing over time. And that it, it, I think that it allows this university and this medical school and this college of uh, education and human development uh, ability to apply ourselves to a big challenge because big you know as we all know great leaders such as this university leaders you this board are made by big challenges this is a big challenge nobody has fixed it nobody has fixed mental health and, and there's no nobody you know close behind us 
The second part of your question is, this is a clinical facility. And this is a clinical facility in the way we understand academic medicine. We do not uh, compare ourselves to the private, nothing against private physicians. You know, they are my colleagues. We trained most of them. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, this is a different approach to this. Because if we can uniquely, not just regionally, but nationally, internationally, connect the uh, the basic science to clinical care delivery without there are going to be no wet labs there there are, it's no mice you know no no animal facilities you know there's going to be a one magnet one one uh, you know three tesla magnet which is the, the magnetic resonance tool uh but that's about it you know but the protocols the decision making that comes with the superior way of thinking about mental health will be anchored in basic science that's not there but it's really focused on patient herself and her family. If I could add something, um, Regent Powell, right now we have a um, Center for Neurobehavioral Development where several faculty from the medical school, faculty from the, from the College of Education and Human Development conduct their research with families. It's a it's an outdated facility. Um, it's too small. Many of our projects are limited by what they can do because of the size of that facility. Um, the other thing that I've seen happen is when our faculty get together and faculty from the medical school, faculty from liberal arts, faculty from our college, um, good things happen. Um, the example that I would use is autism. We have faculty now who've come together from all over the university. Their labs are scattered all over. Um, they, can, they can do better work when they work together and when they're in the same location. Um, they're doing some remarkable work. They're, they're being able to diagnose autism at, what, two months, three months of age, when, when it used to be not until children went to school. The fact that we can now intervene with those children and families that much earlier gives those kids a much, much better chance in life. Okay. Follow up, Regent Powell, or? No, not, not now. Thanks. Well, we may have a few more minutes later. Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, it excites me. This type of thing excites me. Um, and, and I will preface my comments by saying that the numbers have to work, uh, the capital costs have to work, the operating um, expenses and income have to work. <clears throat> but I saw a couple years ago um, research at our child at CEHD when they were being able to use eye movements of young infants to find out if they had autism or not, it's just how far that's gone, so how, how much you have said. So I know that we have a world-class child education research group here. I know we have a world-class um, physicians that can do these things. Quite, quite frankly, opportunities like this are, are somewhat the essence of why I sit on this board. Um, I'm, I was trying to sit here and then thinking in the 1950s when the Variety Club probably wanted to build the first children's all exclusive heart hospital over here. The board was probably sitting here discussing the same thing. A decade later, the University of Minnesota was the only place in the world that could save children with heart problems. So I, I say reach high, be a beacon of hope for these parents. It's not the kids. The kids don't know much about it. But be a beacon of hope for the children or for the parents. Um, you know, you know, the Bible tells us that hope is the anchor of our soul. And I'm a big believer in that. Um, one of my favorite things in, in uh, being part of the university is when I stay at the Graduate Hotel, I meet a lot of parents who are here at the hospital, and they'll tell me about their kids. And I'll tell them, you know, I was one of those kids one day. And uh, they say, wow. And I always feel like I give them a little bit of hope. And it's, I probably haven't done much else here, but I feel good about doing that. So the numbers have to work, but I think this is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for the University of Minnesota to, to reach, uh, we talk about the northern stars that we want to reach. This is one place we have the opportunity to do it. And so 
best of luck, and, and uh, I'm a supporter. Bring me back the numbers that show it's going to work, and I'll, I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson, very, very much for those comments. Regent Hearn. Yes. Mr. Chair, um, Dean Tarlar, my question revolves around, is this a new center, or is it just expanding existing center? Um, and, well, just... Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Hare, uh, it's both, you know, and that's what the excitement, you know, is about. You know, that goes back to uh, what Regent Anderson said, uh, and Regent Anderson, you are a profoundly good man. Thank you for, for the comments and the experience and, and sharing it. Um, uh, but what happens is it's, it's old in a way that some of the elements of the uh, distributed brain, of the collective wisdom, have existed before. You know, we have we, we earned our position as a University of Minnesota to have the magnetic residence, to have the Inquam centers. We earned, you know, our position in psychiatry. My chair of psychiatry is one of the most brilliant uh, people, you know, I know. She's just, just on the top of, you know, where we are. So we independently have prepared our success. We build up our opportunity. In a, we, we sort of build up our own luck, if you will. And then... It snaps together, you know, in this catalytic closure when you have the people next to each other first. There's that collision space that, that, that's so necessary in science and, and any human endeavor. Then on top of that, we have a permissive environment for the, for the families. I, one of you have said family. It is about the family. The, 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 our, <clears throat> We look at the whole family, and I, I always look at the maternal child interface. You know, that's where really, you know, that is the most important thing because uh, we can go further. But, you know, one of the things, you know, is that if, if the mother has a depression, you know, and we treat the depression, we really treat the kid as well. But, uh, you know, it is new in a, in a way that nobody has these pieces. We are the only place in the world, you know, that has these pieces, and we do have the the wisdom of this board and leadership of this university to get us you know, to that stage that mirrors, and I, again, I'm thankful for the previous comments, that absolutely mirrors what has happened in the 60s in the, in the cardiac surgery, that people stopped looking at these blue babies but started operating on them. Enormous amount of courage went into this, and not, enormous amount of ingenuity. In my own field, you know, in oncology, same thing. I, I mentioned before, if I had a childhood leukemia when, you know, I was, you know, four, I would not be speaking here, right? Right? Today, it's, it's not a disease, really, that's life-threatening almost, you know, that, that standard risk. So mental health, you know, there's nothing that I can think of that's more scary than an adolescent at your house having, having first psychotic episode because everything breaks down. There's no health without mental health. And uh, we are in a position to disassemble the problem and... And that's really important. Connect the ideas to the tools and deliver in real time. Can I follow up with that? Um, I think what would help me make the decision, and it's an exciting opportunity, but the building and then the cost of the programming um, and looking at both of that and feeling positive that we could find or generate that money to maintain the programming that will actually go into the building. Mm -hmm. I'd feel good about that. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Regent Hare, very important question. And I think, you know, I heard this from Regent Powell, Regent Anderson, and others. Of course, you know, it is important to provide for the operating costs. Of course, it is important to get you know, the, the foundational money and then the one money that, but enormously gratifying response that we have received. We already have secured a, a funding in excess of $30 million. So, so we have something, you know, to look at. And, um, I happen, because of this idea, I happen to co-chair what's called Itasca project, uh, which is gathering of these quite influential and good willing, you know, people in town. And the, the appetite in the, in the donor, and thought leadership of the of of the of the metro at least is enormous. 
You know, I, I, I compare it to, do, I do a lot of fundraising for, for oncology. There's no comparison. You know, people are coming out of everywhere because we are looking, what, how is this going to happen in North Minneapolis, housing? We are looking, how is this going to change social determinants of health, you know, in, uh, uh, in Phillips' neighborhood? You know, that is, you know, the gra gravity of this project. This is not medicine alone. This is not education alone. This is truly a societal intervention, societal gesture of goodwill. Thank you. I, you know, I think it's, it's on the mind, though, of this board that we're going to need some business plan, not a treatise, but something that, that you know, talks about the capital costs and the operating costs, because this is not an ins insignificant investment. Okay. Chair Beeson, you know, I got the same direction from the treasurer of the university, and <laughs> yes, I will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was going to hear things twice or more. Okay. And you may hear a third time. Regent Spigham, do you want to no, Mr. deliver Chair. that message? Or? Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And with all due respect to yourself, Mr. Chairman, and all due respect to Regent Anderson, who's not as good as you think he is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And all respect to uh, all respect to President Gable and others. I have to tell you honestly, when I listen to you, Jacob, I become mesmerized. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's your vision, your strategy, your passion, your energy, or your voice, but I I become mesmerized. I got to pinch myself, and make sure I get back on on the game here. Um, and uh, let, let me first say, I think this is an exciting opportunity. The way you laid out, it's a it's, it's maybe in our plan, maybe not, but sometimes you have to seize the day, right? Carpe diem. It, it comes, it maybe it wasn't in the plan five years ago, but if not us, who? It's not, somebody's going to buy that, right? And yeah. and better be us, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, and, and I was briefed on it with Chairman Powell maybe a month and a half ago when we were talking about this agenda, and I, I don't remember the conversation. It was that small. And I think all we said, well, let's let Jake Toller handle it in the September meeting. Now, I think we could have had better communication on this. And, and that's my fault. That's my fault. I apologize for not communicating better maybe with my colleagues or the regents because I, I open up the paper last week or an article and find out we've already purchased it uh, for, what was it, 23.5 million or whatever. I don't remember making the decision. Uh, but there was a newspaper article I thought it said that. And this is a point of information, Regis Fagan. We have not bought property yet. I can, Mr. But Chairman. I, I know we have not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're telling a story. <laughs> Tell us a story. Me. <laughs> I think the newspaper article might have been a little ahead of the game, uh, and but it got, a, all, got me a little nervous, and maybe some of the rest of you got nervous. And I think we could have a little better communication regarding the thought and potential purchase or whatever. But the fact is, when you get when I get behind that, beyond that, which was probably my fault uh, for not communicating better, this is an exciting opportunity. And the way you lay it out, uh, Mr. Toller, uh, certainly there's gotta be a business plan, but I'm all in. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Um, and now we're gonna go keep moving to Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and that's actually a pretty good lead-in. Um, you know, the, this I know this property pretty well, having lived in Macro Oakland and used the, the river road for <laughs> recreation and, and so on. It's a beautiful piece of property, and I like the fact, in fact, I'll, I'll buy a pair of binoculars so that when President Gable is riding in the back of her Ford Topaz being driven to the office, she can keep an eye on it on her way to work every day. So it's, uh, it, it's well it's well placed, and... Um, and I'm, I'm very excited. I, you know, I, I, you know, Regent Her actually kind of turned the conversation a little bit the way I would like to. There's no question that the mesmerizing, you know, conversation about the work that's going to be done here is is incredible. And in fact, I'm listening to it, and I'm listening to Regent Anderson, and I'm thinking about you know mental health being like the new heart, um, uh, you know, research at the university where this is where we can really help the world in a way that we did you know oh, so many years ago and, and, uh, and through today. So that's that's great. The question though is, you know, can we not do it without the facility and and, and whatever? Now here here's the fact: the, the evidence based on the fact that you just dropped this nugget about thirty million dollars being raised already or committed um, to this, 
it's a no-brainer, right, as a, as a decision. But I, I would just say that, um, you know, kind of tying it back together, that when I pick up the paper and I, you know, there's a, mat, there's a, there's a project that I've never seen in any, you know, <laughs> facilities plan, I've never heard of in any way, shape, or form, and I'm reading that, that you know, the board on which I serve has approved it. Um, he, w whether it's misrepresent, you know, misreported or not, it, I, I lose connections between the few brain cells that I, that I have, and, and, and uh, it, that's, that's frustrating. So to that extent, just, you know, I guess a, a point that if we're having conversations over the course of 10 months on something of this variety that would impact these plans that, that we, you know, continuously work on this board, that would be important to me. Because otherwise I start thinking, well, what other $20 million projects are, are being developed right now that I've never heard of? And, and that makes me a little bit nervous. Setting that aside, you know, this is, this is really remarkable. I mean, it's right, it's right in our neighborhood. I mean, I, you can make so many different arguments. Access to this facility compared to trying to come through the, you know, the, the uh, um, intensity and the, the compact location of our current medical facilities on this campus, it's just glorious. I mean, as a parent, you can, you know, the difference between trying to find parking <laughs> over here and uh, versus driving onto this beautiful little mini campus uh, with the facilities that are there, it, it will be a uh, sea change, I think, for what, what you're doing and what, you, what you're offering. So I'm excited about that. But in the future, uh, sooner is better for understanding that we're having these conversations and uh, um, to make sure that, that there's a confidence by members of this board that when we look at these plans for facilities that we understand everything that's going on and that, that we won't have you know, things kind of coming in this way. Now, to that extent, as we go into the conversation, the more information you can provide us about the, the philanthropy that's, that's behind this and that will support this, I mean, this almost sounds like you're coming to talk about a gift. Um, as opposed to an acquisition by the institution, because if that money is coming from those sources to buy it, you know, it won't have an impact on our uh, capital capacity. Um, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what uh, what that looks like and, and where this goes in, in the coming years. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've got Regent Mayron, Shu, McMillan, and the student representative DeMuth. Thank you, Regent. And Arm Russell, who goes next? Oh. Uh, okay. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Um, I am very excited about uh, the concept of the Institute of Child and Adolescent Brain Health. So um, I am sold on it. It's, it's thrilling, and I think it, it fits with um, the discussions we've had, strategic discussions we've had about the importance of our role in medicine and advancing medicine and research and providing good clinical uh, uh, services to the state of Minnesota and beyond. The question for me is, do we need a building that's going to be $55 million to both purchase and to renovate and then ultimately operate? And it sounds like that the, um, and, and that's, maybe Regent Hare was getting to that, um, I don't know if a new building or a building was in the works or part of what we've been talking about in terms of the investment uh, in the medical segment um, until this opportunity arose. And then we said, you know, this is something that we are, this is an opportunity we can't pass up on. And we weren't talking about a building before, but now we should because of its proximity and what it offers. And if that's so, then that's helpful for me to know. If, if we didn't need a building before, but we still want to advance this whole area, how are we intending to do it? And could we still do it without a building? And, and the question is because it's a lot of money. Um, so I'd, I'd like to understand that, that. Then the other questions are, and you've already um, intimated that you've that there is substantial commitment, financial commitment that you've already identified. But the questions I had is, what happens if we don't raise the money to buy it? What if we don't raise adequate money to renovate it? Who is going to pay for it? How do we pay for it then? Uh, ultimately, as I understand it, it's the two colleges that are going to own this enterprise, own the building. Um, the university would own it, I presume, but the two colleges are going to be responsible for it. If we can't cover the $3 million estimated operating expenses, where does that money come from? Um, so I, I, that's more weeds questions. Um, there's the big picture, there's the weeds, and then there's the piece on the lease back. What is that arrangement looking like for the Shriners if we're going to lease it back to them? What are the terms of the lease back, which aren't a part of the materials that we've received to date? So, 
multifaceted set of questions. I apologize, but I don't know if I'll get another opportunity. So I'm getting them all on the and table. Thank now. you, <laughs> Regent Mayor. And I might suggest that you know there are a series of questions there that, uh, and I know the presenters are going to be available for phone calls and meetings if that's necessary to sure. follow up because they're these and they're all important and obviously um, fiduciary type questions. But in general, would you like to answer that, Dean uh, Toller and? Uh, and, uh, Chair Beeson, uh, capitalize it quickly. Then, Chair Beeson, I, I, I'll ask the first question first. Regent Mayron, uh, do we need a building? Well, that's a question of how successful you want to be. You know, because when I look and I'll report to this board, you know, tomorrow, you know, in the perspective of the healthcare plan and joint clinical enterprise, it's always a question, in my opinion, uh, that economics is like gravity. You know, you, it permeates everything. You know, it does have a force, you know, gravitational force to it. So uh, if we really want to be successful in this, yes, of course we need that building because it's a question of capacity. Do we have the set of skills that we can succeed? That's number one. And the answer is yes. Distribute it, yes. But can we scale it? That's the problem. And we would not be able to scale that, that energy and that investment in intellectual capacity that we have today at this university if we did not have that building. I mean, building like that. This one is a perfect one. But, you know, if, you know a building where these services can come together. And the reason why is that, that the families, uh, I think Regent Rocha said it best, that the families want to come to a place that is a environmentally uh, permissive to what they need and have everybody around this. Mr. Herford and I will tell you tomorrow that we have rethought how healthcare is, uh, is, is, is done. Uh, it centers not on the payer. It centers not on the you know, buildings necessarily. It centers on the patient and her family. And that's why we need that building. The second question, very briefly, the operating costs, you know, no one, none of us owns our future. I don't know, you know, what's going to happen five years from you now. Don't? I don't, I don't. And I'm actually excited about that. You know, it'd be pretty boring if, it, if I did. Uh, but, 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 but the, the Bayesian, you know, priors, you know, tell me, you know, that the energy in the environment is such that if we are going to do this in a disi disciplined, transparent way, with integrity and deliver, there's, there's very high chance. There's, it's essentially given that people will go after this, donors and, you know, and, and payers eventually, that will help us support this. And the lease back, I have to defer to uh, Leslie on that. Mr. Chair. Thank you. I think we'll get into that detail later on the lease back. And, and That's fair. I, I think we can get that answer um, through you. Uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. This is extremely thrilling. I could only be more thrilled in one way, and that's if there was a strategic plan that actually said we needed to do this, which I think is missing. And it's because we don't have one yet. But we're working on that, and I expect this to be included in that. And I think that part of my concern over this project is not the fact that it'll be too small, but maybe it'll be too big for that property. And so I'll wait to see your business plan to explain why this is the perfect place for that, since I've, I'm basically hearing about what its intended use is for the first time, or at least when this docket came out. Um, but I will say that um, if, if, in fact, I think I heard you say this is the only place in the world that would have that. I don't, did I hear that right or not? Mr. Chair, Regent Chu, yes, you did hear me okay. right. Thank you. So if, if, in fact, we are building something like that, it sounds like something that someone needs to do. <clears throat> Why not us? Um, in terms of how the money is going to be uh, assembled to do this, you know, we'll have to talk about that. But it doesn't seem like really a huge investment. Although I did want to hear how M Health you mentioned um, James uh, Hereford, uh, I do want to kind of understand how M Health is going to be part of part of this, and um, you know what their thoughts are on it. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Shu, excellent questions. Uh, the strategic plan, you know, I point well taken. You know, we don't have one. In my opinion, this fits in the strategy and mission, land grant mission of the university, medical school and college for education and human development. Uh, we didn't. 
you know some of the opportunities as, as you know very well you know from the uh, from the uh, areas of technology uh, are difficult to predict this is you know classic IT problem agile systems you know some the, the period of, of how things are turning around is so quick that it's sometimes not amendable to the uh, to the strategic plan you know conceived you know of old uh, too big for its purpose uh, I don't think it is. Uh, I think, you know, if you have, uh, again, 10 exam rooms, you know, uh, 19 exam rooms, 10 overnight beds, uh, the, uh, you know, 172 parking spots in this location, that seems like the, the appropriate size. You know, we have looked at the number of faculty and uh, 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 Leslie's team and uh, uh, senior vice president. Uh, Burnett's team have been very, very helpful in actually putting these pieces together. So I think this is the right size. I fully expect, you know, that there is going to be refinements along the way, and we actually want to be, you know, in this agile system uh, mindset and iterate, you know, as we go forward. And uh, the M Health, this is not a part of the joint clinical enterprise. You know, this is a part of that of that lateral supporting structure that is uh, that is supporting the joint clinical enterprise and the university at the same time. It's complementary, it's synergistic, but it's not exclusive to it. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, if, yeah, I'm good, thank you. You're good, thank you. President Gable, do you have anything that you uh, would like to add in terms of how you're well, your initial reaction to the obviously, I assume you're supportive, but uh, anything else you want to you care to illuminate on with this project? Um, absolutely, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, presenters. The um, I will just second and pull together several briefly several sentiments expressed uh, both by the presenters and by the questions posed, which is that while. Um, the space opportunity has come up quickly. The work that makes us able to um, leverage the space has been ongoing and accelerating. Uh, this is um, the question of the day. You've heard me talk about this from the beginning. Um, I see absolutely no reason why we wouldn't want to be the thought leaders in a solution orientation around this incredibly important scientific, clinical, and social challenge. And this space, particularly with the um, external support that is already um, accumulating seems to be a unique opportunity for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Student representatives, your question been asked yet? Uh, Thank you, Chair Beeson and um, our regents. So obviously we are all incredibly excited about this opportunity for the university to really grow our experiences. Um, futuristically, how do you see students able to interact with this center? And um, is this an opportunity for experiential learning, um, internships, research? What do you see as the student's role in that? Mr. Chair. The question's been answered. Yes, Dean Toller, a great question, student representative. Um, great question, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative. Uh, this is actually brilliant that you are bringing this up because uh, everything at this university is education. Everything at this university is united, you know, in having people that will come after us do, you know, what we are aiming to do today. So, experiential learning, the vocational ideal of this university, has been a integral part of everything that we have ever talked about in this Shrano's Hospital. So uh, it's going to come, but it's different than before, because in the spirit of the comprehensive collaboration, this is going to come from multiple colleges across the university, and it's going to be, hopefully, uh, training the next generation of people that will serve here, but also through the state. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, the demands on services of this kind and understanding of this kind are statewide. They are not just in the metro. So absolutely, the, 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 uh, the training arm of this, the educational arm of this is an integral part of the design. Thank you for your question. I, I would Thank also you. add that there would be um, uh, research assistantships and graduate assistantships that would pay the students to, to also have those experiences. Thank you, Dean Quam. Right, thank you, presenters, for this uh, really exciting, important uh, opportunity. We're going to move along then to the other matter in front of us, and I'm going to ask staff to truncate their comments if they would on the this is the Murphy Warehouse discussion uh, that uh, 
they most of them have had a chance to talk to staff one-on-one -on -one about. Um, and I'll just ask the, as the, uh, Mr. Brittleson's coming back up uh, to uh, just say a couple of words about this and then uh, we, we need to move through this in about 15 minutes and then um, the other agenda items quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, I'll be turning this over quickly to uh, Assistant Vice President Kruger and Vice President Bertelson. But as we've <clears throat> discussed with this board over the last few months, uh, we believe it's a strategic decision to consider, for your consideration, the sale of a real estate asset. Um, so, uh, and ironically, they're about the same value, um, at least uh, and that was just a total happenstance. But um, while this uh, property was acquired not that long ago, it does present an opportunity for us given the changing dynamics. And I think we uh, have a short presentation um, that has followed some other communications we've had with the board about our rationale for this. So if with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn over. Well, we can turn over two minute presentation and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you. All right. I'm Jim Beeson, members of the committee. Uh, our second item today is the sale of the proposed sale for review of 701 24th Avenue, Southeast Minneapolis, otherwise known as Murphy Warehouse. And so for those of you who have been on the board for a number of years, you will recall the university's purchase of the nearly 22 acre property in December 2015. The university purchased the property for almost $18 million with a donation of the remaining property's value from the seller estimated at $2 million. It consists of 38 interconnected buildings totaling over 706,000 square feet constructed between 1902 and 1977. At the close in 2015, the University of Marehouse and Murphy Warehouse Company entered into a 10-year leaseback of the majority of the building's space. The site continues to serve as the headquarters of the Murphy Warehouse Company. It also houses the university bookstore warehouse operations, as well as some departmental storage. The older brick buildings at the front along Elm Street are remain vacant. So again, the question that we asked last time about what is the strategic purpose in acquiring the property, and so in this case, what is the strategic purpose, uh, the strategic reason that the university is proposing to dispose of the property? And that is really fourfold, and I won't go into the detail that I had planned on this one, but we had received two unsolicited offers uh, in the past year regarding this property, and that was prompted by changes in the federal tax law related to the opportunity zones. And this property is located in an opportunity zone, which allows investors who develop real estate and new companies that locate within opportunity zones to uh, receive significant benefit from the tax laws. And so as a result of those first two unsolicited offers, we decided to test the market, see if there was some opportunity for ourselves uh, to consider the disposition of this property. Also, uh, it does free up the university's debt capacity for more strategic land acquisitions. Since 2015, we've focused and the board, we've reviewed with the board our new development framework, which really focuses our attention and our strategic capital investments back into the renovation of the core of campus, as well as in the Southeast Gateway area, really focused on the ex future expansion of our clinical <coughs> enterprise. And uh, significantly, um, it does avoid significant capital investments in building systems that are required for the property. And so the transaction overview, the purchaser, the proposed purchaser is Ryan Companies U.S. Incorporated. The proposed sale price is $22 million with $250,000 earnest money. As Senior Vice President Burnett uh, pointed out, that was just uh, coincidental in terms of uh, the comparability to Shriners. Uh, the proposed closing is December 18th of 2019 in order for the buyer to take full advantage of the Opportunity Zone tax credits. The buyer would assume the Murphy Warehouse lease through its existing term. And similar to the Shriners property, the sale is contingent upon a successful negotiation of a lease back with the university to occupy some space in the facility for our ongoing bookstore operations and some of our other departmental storage. Ryan is planning an extensive renovation and repositioning of the brick and timber buildings at the north end. Uh, to be used as creative office space. They also plan significant uh, capital investment, including roof, sprinklers, HVACs, vertical transportation, uh, elevators, uh, masonry repairs, and electrical upgrades. And um, 
they believe it will be very uh, attractive for uh, a number of local companies and mid-sized growing firms to locate near the university as well as to take advantage of the Opportunity Zone tax credits. They are planning on uh, maintaining the existing occupancy and use of the warehouse space behind the brick and timber buildings at the front on Long Elm. And with that, that concludes my very, as quick as I could, presentation. You've been very busy, Assistant Vice President Kruger. We appreciate the, uh, that. Uh, I'll open this up for questions from my colleagues. Jason, do you have a list of anybody signed up? Yeah. <laughs> Regent Shue and then Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Beeson. Thank you, presenters. Um, I really don't have any questions about this. The real question is, you know, should we be selling 22 acres that close to campus? And my feeling is no. I was on the board when we uh, purchased this property. And you know, aside from all these other things that are going on with it, I think the real reason um, that we wanted to buy it was because it was a large uh, tract of property 22 acres um, close to campus. Um, there's going to be a day when the railroad tracks are going to be removed and that land is going to go to somebody, hopefully the university. And so I, I really think that we would be doing uh, boards of the future a disservice if we uh, sold it for uh, 22 million. In fact, I think, you know, if, if we were to receive a, uh, an offer, offer that we couldn't turn down, have to be significantly more than 22 million, uh, then we would consider we could consider that. But I think in this case, um, it, to me, it's not worth 22 million to let go of that property. We'll never, um, in the future, be able to purchase that much property again. Um, so that's my feeling. Thank you, Regent Powell. Uh, thanks, Chair Beeson. Um, can, can you give us some estimate of were we to keep it um, of? Uh, and, and I'm, for me, the jury's out right now. But were we to keep it, what's the, what's the carrying cost going to be? I mean, it, because if we've got you, you, you mentioned that there's, we're likely going to have to start to invest. The buildings are really old. They're going to be. So I, you know, I just like to know how much we're going to have to spend there each year. Uh, it's not really very highly utilized, I don't think, right now. But so how much are we going to have to spend each year just to sort of, if you will, keep it safe? <clears throat> Advice. You don't have to answer that now, but I think it's something I'd like to understand. Okay. You can follow up. I think up we can get that, that detail for yep. you, but that there is a cost. Uh, you know, I'll just make a comment that um, we don't even have two acres or even two lots of extra land or land bank property around the campus. And um, uh, so I do like the idea of having something available to trade or to build on. At some point, uh, this could be space for athletic. I think that whole that whole industrial area will change. It's either going to be redeveloped as housing, or it could be other uses. So, yeah, I I appreciate you're being good stewards by telling us this is sort of sur this is not critical today for the universe. You're doing your job with that, and you're bringing it, you're bringing back a property that's that's with a price that's more than what we paid for it. And I I really respect that, but. I think our job is to, is to think long, uh, a longer view, and this area is going to change really quickly. And uh, this is one the only opportunity I've ever seen where we could have some extra land for a need that we don't even know exists today. But it will be. There will be an opportunity down the line where we wish we had had the land. That's my view. Uh, Regent Rocha, and then second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. <laughs> Also, having been on the board at the time when um, the arguments for why we would acquire the property were made, and, and uh, one that's not involved is that, or hasn't been talked about, is that uh, Murphy made a contribution to the university, uh, intended to make a contribution to the university by virtue of selling it to us at a at a favorable price, and and I think that that's something to be respected as well going forward. Um, I you know I don't think that was necessarily including the thought that within a few years we'd be selling it to a, another commercial enterprise to, uh, to take the property, because I'm sure that the Murphy Enterprise could have done that themselves, but for the fact that they wanted to do something for the university. And so I think that deserves respect. Um, as it relates to the, when, when I think about decisions that we make, um, 
I, it's frustrating, you can imagine, um, when, you know, I, I was looking at the, the language about how one of the, one of the purposes for which we acquired it, and it wasn't a hard sell for me because I come from the, the mindset that any time we can get land that's contiguous or even close to contiguous to our, our urban campus, we have to take that opportunity. And we know how many millions per acre we, were, we just spent for land that's just a few blocks from this. And so on a per square foot basis, this is not even in the ballpark. Um, but when we say, well, we're gonna put the, we're gonna do this library storage here, oh, we can't do that. I, you know, from a, from a commercial enterprise, I wanna make sure my people have looked into those things before they tell me we can do this, because it was really just a matter of weeks before we learned that one of the bases doesn't, doesn't actually pan out. But um, I, I give a pass on that, because I didn't really, the, the storage was, a, it was like a little cherry. That was a, a small advantage to it. Really, it was the function of being able to acquire this very important piece of land that, as has been pointed out, maybe it may be contiguous at some point in, in, in the not so distant future. But when I, when I think about, well, why would we sell this? What is, what's the mission basis? And when the number one bullet is opportunity zone tax incentives for private sector demand, that's not our mission. Uh, my mission is not to satisfy private sector demand based on uh, zone tax incentives. And so it's a, it's a bit of a non-starter from my perspective. Um, you know, there is the debt capacity component, but again, this was a subsidized purchase based on a gift. Um, and, you know, Regent Beeson, I think, aptly stated that um, this is really important uh, land. We, I don't know how many people in the room would remember, but um, around 95, as I was chair of facilities, we started a condemnation proceeding for some land that's a little bit west of there. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, in the process of defending the condemnation proceeding in a competition with the city, um, our answer wasn't, wasn't precise enough. And I was no longer on the board at that point and wasn't called because I knew that we had specific interests such as a dormitory, as well as that may have been the location of, of uh, some of our sports fields where we could have consolidated all of our sports fields in this, in this, uh, in this area. And, and that the loss of that land has been, has been a challenge for us for a long time. And it was, it was turned into an, an enterprise zone. And you know, we certainly won't be touching that for any time uh, soon. So um, I think it would be imprudent um, to, uh, um, to reverse field on this. I think the case that was made in, nine, in 15, rather, was, was a strong case. And uh, I, I don't think that I've seen anything close to, to, uh, to changing my mind that this is an important um, piece of property for the university. I was also kind of surprised. I kind of thought perhaps it was something where they came in with a plan and said, well, this is something we're going to build that's going to serve the community. But really, it sounds like just kind of maintenance of the property as it is. Well, um, I don't know that that's a, a necessarily a great interest of ours at this point. So I would, um, I, I would not be supportive of this, of this sale. Thanks. Regent Sfigum. Mr. Chairman, um, Regent Rosha, I will be supportive of the sale for a number of reasons. Uh, and I was not here when it was purchased, obviously. But uh, uh, for, first of all, it seems to me that the university or any public sector, state or federal, should not be in the purpose of land, bank, land banking land. It could be or should be in the private sector paying taxes. And I think this is really crucial in St. Paul and Minneapolis, as much as the property is uh, um, tax-free within St. Paul. Mr. Chairman, you know yourself, I think in St. Paul over half the land does not pay taxes. I think that's correct. Um, without a purpose and a mission, if there was a real purpose or a mission for having this land, I would easily be um, on your side, easily be convinced not to sell it. But I don't see the purpose or the mission. I haven't heard of it. Um, I don't think we should be in the in the position of, of, of land banking, that's, that's not what our role is. It's not what our mission is as, as the state. It's on the other side of the tracks, yes. What, what are, are there 10, 12 tracks here? Uh, not very accessible. Close, but not very accessible. And I don't know if the railroads are going to go out. I was thinking we should probably have more railroads in this country, not less. I, I want less trucks on the road. And one of the ways to move cargo is the railroad. It seems to be more efficient. That's a whole different issue. But... Uh, I guess I would be very open to this proposal and prospect as opposed to my good friends who have spoken otherwise. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Mr. Chair. Anybody else would like to put... Ha having been water. cited. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, Regent Swigum, it'll all be drones soon, so you don't have to worry about the railroad. Um, it, it is a fair point, uh, but unlike rural liberal arts campuses, we, we face 
conditions that are different than others. And part of part of the circumstance in, in having lived through this time where we didn't have facilities, I mean, right now we need dorms. We know we need dorms. It's been part of our strategic conversation for a long time. And we don't have space for dorms. We also don't have space for swing space at times. So the FMC building, which is the the building that's on the other side of 35W from the West Bank, um, that was acquired as swing space because we simply didn't have any. And um, it was a temporary matter, and now it has been a fairly permanent matter. And, and I think that the, the, the condition here is we had an opportunity to ex accept this land from Mr. Murphy um, it, with as a gift um, where we had to make an investment, and that gives us an op opportunity. And I. If, if we want to be rigid, um, we could suggest the same thing. You know, the, the, the property on East River Road, the Shriners facility, it's nice, but we're not in the business of acquiring land. We can, we can do that same sort of research, you know, in our current facility. I mean, you can take it, you can take it to that extreme. I, I'm just simply saying that when we've had opportunities to, 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 to have land, to give us those opportunities going forward, and whether it is a matter of, of trading for something that is then a specific need, this gives us options. And, um, I feel a duty to future boards to put them in a position to do that because I've been in a situation where we have been broke and landless and, and yet having to try to meet the you know, expanding needs of a, of a very important uh, land-grant university. So um, I, I appreciate the sentiment, uh, but I think that it, it takes it to the extreme and, and doesn't actually um, put the university in the position that we as a board ought to be trying to put the university. This will be the final comment, Regent Anderson. I don't mean to I run the clock out. Uh, no, I'm fine with that. Uh, Regent Stigham's wrath at me for running over. <laughs> I, get, I get it too. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I wasn't going to say anything, but I, uh, I appreciate that. I think there's a lot of variables here. Uh, Regent Beeson, you bring up thanks to, to the, the realty people and the, the community university services for bringing this to us, showing us that we can make a profit. Something I hadn't thought about was Regent Rocha said a lot of times we talk about donor intent. What was the Murphy family's intent? You know, I. I I appreciate you bringing that up. And I also, you know, <laughs> agree sometimes with Regent Smigum. Are we in a, a land bank business? Maybe we shouldn't be. I just think it gives us all the next 30 days we really have to, to dig into this and find out, you know, it's one of those difficult decisions that fundamental to, to what we do. And it's, it's, it's a difficult decision and there's a lot of sides to it. So I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. That's a good wrap up comment. Uh, for the next month. I'm going to move ahead then to the consent report. Uh, are there any items that members wish to separate out? And not hearing any, is there a motion to recommend approval of the report? So, second. There's a motion, and I'll take Regent uh, Davenport as a second. Any discussion? Uh, I guess um, we're just going to go, we go right to. All those being in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, say no. Motion carries. Thank you. Informational items. Uh, Senior Vice President Burnett. There's just a uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's a number of uh, reports in the in the information report. We're happy to spend any time with any member of the board on any of these about asset management or the investment advisory committee. Uh, sustainability report I would call the committee's attention to is uh, very uh, well done, I believe, in quarterly purchasing report. Thank you very much for your time today. Okay, we are wrapped up unless there's anything else for the agenda today. It's 502. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks the staff and the board members. We had, we got through a lot of material. Regent McMillan, if you're still hanging on, have a good evening and uh, maybe talk to you tomorrow. Thank you, Chair Beeson. Thank you. Thank you.